And we are live, Mayor Ostrander. Thank you, Mr. Street. I will call this meeting to order at 6.30 p.m. by formally recognizing the traditional keepers of this land and specifically our neighbors of the Alderville First Nation with a formal territorial acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that the municipality of Brighton is located on the Mississauga Anishinaabeg territory and is the traditional territory of the Mississauga. The Council of the Municipality of Brighton respectfully acknowledges that the Mississauga Nation are the collective stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. I will also advise that due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, this meeting will be held using electronic conference technology. Members of council and staff are all engaging in tonight's meeting through video conference. We also have delegations coming to us uh, through the same form of technology. The public is invited to join us by viewing this meeting live on the Municipality of Brighton YouTube channel. Uh, I will also note, maybe I don't think we, we don't have any camera sessions, so I don't need to note that. And with that, I will take a motion that council approve the April 19th, 2021 council meeting agenda as presented. Is there a mover? Councilor Rowley, seconded by Councilor Bateman. Is there any discussion? Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Councilor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councilor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councilor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councilor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councilor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Bank? Yes. Mayor Brian Ostrander. Yes. It's carried. Thank you. And members of council, please declare any pecuniary interests if you have them and state the general nature thereof. And there are none noted. Are there any announcements this evening? Councilor LeBlanc? Yes, I don't know if the rest of the council knew, Your Honor, but uh, Mary, Councilor Tadman, uh, is now the uh, the vice chair of the um, the lower trend, and she was Express. not letting us know about that. <laughs> I'm, I'm roll, not I'm supposed to tell things. Roll, so. There's no doubt coveted, Councillor Tadman. No doubt. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, Councillor Blanc, and thank you, Councillor Tadman, for stepping up to that role. Councillor Rowley. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, I want to thank uh, both. Uh, Mr. Hagerman and Mr. Uh, Parkinson today for rolling out the uh, the announcement on uh, social media and through the municipal website regarding the cleanup that will be going on in Brighton. There's been a lot of chatter. There's been a lot of people who have already uh, stepped up. So uh, kudos for them to getting it organized fairly quickly and um, kudos to the citizens of Brighton who want to see our streets and roadsides cleaned up. Thank you. And of course, this isn't a, a, a gathering event. We don't want people to gather outside of their household. But Councillor Rowley, could you just give a, a quick synopsis of what uh, of what the, the cleanup means and what will happen over the course of this week and next? Um, okay, so I think uh, folks will just be um, kind of encouraged to clean up in their own neighborhoods, their own roadsides, their own streets to pick up garbage, it would be uh, then a good idea to phone um, the uh, public works office at Sharp Road. I believe the uh, advertisement that Ben has put out has the, uh, not only the phone number, but the extension to call. Call them so that uh, the public works staff at the beginning of next week can pick up all of the roadside trash. Uh, yeah, it's certainly not the same as what we've had with uh, the county pitch-in initiative, but uh, I think Brighton wants to dust up a little. So I, I, I think it's great. There's a lot of people who have already uh, cleaned up a lot. I've seen a lot of bags all around and uh, hopefully people will kind of keep them, um, keep them home and put them out next week so they're not uh, kicked all about all week. Thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements? Move on to the adoption of the minutes, and I might need a motion that Council adopt the April 6, 2021 Council meeting minutes as presented. Mayor Bank, second. Who wants to second these? Oh, I will. Councillor Anderson, does that, was that you? Yes. Sorry, I lost you on the screen there, huh? 
there any discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councilor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councilor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councilor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councilor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councilor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. That's carried. Thank you. And a motion that Council adopt the April 12, 2021 planning meeting minutes as presented. Is there a move? Mayor Vink, seconded by Councillor Anderson. Any discussion? The clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Mm, Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. Carried? Thank you. We have no statutory public meeting this evening. Uh, Council will hear two, tele two delegations this evening. Uh, it is noted that the language, content, and conduct must remain respectful at all times. Council will be provided with an opportunity to ask questions of clarification from the delegation representative based on the information that they present. Council is reminded that this is not an opportunity to engage in debate with the delegate nor advance a public policy position. Our first delegation is uh, Mr. Pacini, our member of provincial parliament, and I'll turn the floor over to you, sir. Well, thank you very much, Your Worship. It's wonderful uh, to join all of you, uh, Brighton Council staff, uh, residents uh, virtually, albeit. Um, I don't know if that was a standard intro for delegations or or if uh, that uh, honor for you. Special for you. <laughs> <laughs> We're all friends. Uh, anyways, um, it's great to be with all of you, um, all of you this evening uh, to highlight uh, budget, uh, the the provincial budget. I know, obviously, in the heels of uh, the federal budget today, um, I'll even highlight a, a couple synergies. I took a brief look at the federal budget, which includes some uh, some good investments that are that are run, as, you know, very much in synergy with with things the province is doing. So I'll allude to that as well. I'll first start by just uh, addressing, obviously, uh, the latest with respect to COVID nineteen. Um, the you know emergence of the COVID variant is uh, is very concerning. We've seen an increase in in cases, obviously, in our own community and in uh, specifically the hotspot regions of uh, of the GTA. This is very difficult and uh, as the nation uh, grapples with the third wave, uh, Ontario obviously being our largest province and, uh, and being uh, the hub of uh, much of the economic activity in our country certainly is not immune uh, with, uh, with the Canada's largest airport that still continues to allow um, thousands of international passengers in, a in, in on a daily basis. We're certainly not immune uh, from, from the, the, the concerns and the variants. Uh, having said that, obviously very difficult measures that are having a very real impact, a real impact on small businesses, on families, on uh, un understand the mental health and well-being of, of Ontarians, um, you know, in particular of concern to me, but also across Canada and across the globe. So, as we as we deal with this, uh, you know, this the province has had to take obviously additional measures to, with it aim to restrict uh, and, and limit mobility um, and and the ability of the COVID nineteen uh, highly contagious variants to spread. This has had immense pressures on our ICUs. Obviously, the government's put in place a number of measures to address ICU capacity. I think uh, system wide, and you'll hear it a bit in the budget. Um, you know, the, dealing with a, a pandemic concurrently while you're reforming healthcare, and and I think the pandemic has really shown the need for some systemic changes in our healthcare system across the province of Ontario. So I'll allude to that a bit in the budget, but I just wanted to uh, preface uh, this by by thanking all of you for the work you're doing. I know this isn't an easy time, um, in particularly uh, staff as well for for you know, maintaining service delivery and and working hard for for the residents of Brighton. So thank you for all that uh, all of you do. I'll start uh, budget uh, 2021. Um, a couple things. I just want to want this to be a Q&A. So I'll just uh, briefly go through a couple key measures that I think are, are important for our community. Uh, first, obviously, the budget uh, focuses on two things, uh, protecting people's health 
and supporting Ontario's economy. You can't have a healthy economy without healthy people. So in the budget, it uh, brings total investments of uh, $16.3 billion to protecting health and $23.3 billion to protecting our economy. Our action plan supports now total $51 billion. But what does that mean? Uh, this is a, a lot. Of, these are big numbers. The so one, uh, the Regional Opportunity Ta Investment Tax Credit. And that was one um, that stems back to earlier uh, meetings with our finance committee, where we had a, a very productive meeting in Belleville, I would add, uh, with a number of regional uh, mayors. And the really the genesis behind this is how we incentivize development in rural Ontario outside the GTHA. Uh, so with the Rural Opportunities Investment Tax Credit, um, it's a 20% refundable income tax credit, a corporate income tax credit available uh, to Canadian controlled private corporations that make investments in eligible geographic areas of Ontario, of which uh, in Eastern Ontario, the border is our, is our uh, county. So everything East, uh, Northumberland and to the East. And this is available for expenditures in excess of 50,000 and up to 500,000 a year uh, for investments that become available in this uh, calendar year. So we've doubled this tax credit and, um, and, and this uh, is eligible in, as I said, our county. So any sort of, I mean, if you think to a recent announcement today, for example, Mermo, uh, from Trenton expanding to the old DART facility up in, in Campbellford, any sort of expansion, purchase of property would be eligible for that. So as we look to investments in affordable housing, investments into uh, growth of, of small businesses, manufacturing, our industrial parks, this um, and I, you know, with a specific eye to Ben there, uh, we can really promote this as a, as a tool in our arsenal to attract investment. The temporary uh, jobs training tax credit, you'll note in the federal budget today, uh, there were announcements on training. This is certainly a theme you're seeing from all levels of government. We need to be nimble. We want to train tomorrow's workforce. Uh, so with that in mind, the province introduced the temporary Ontario or the Ontario job training tax credit, I should say. And that is uh, up to uh, a maximum credit of up to $2,000. Uh, and the Ontario jobs training tax credit is uh, available in the 2021 personal income tax return. And, and this really, I want to highlight some of the investments. We can anything on uh, occupational skills courses, occupational trade or professional exams, post-secondary education courses, uh, you know, even staff within the municipality growing uh, within their profession, um, I think to our skilled trades gap and, uh, and the support that this uh, can be utilized for. And, and when augmented uh, with the federal benefit, this is significant support uh, to have a highly skilled workforce in, in Canada and in the province of Ontario. So as I said, uh, that'll be key for, for retraining and for uh, tuition and other fees page, uh, paid to eligible uh, education in, in institutions in Canada, which are both obviously our publics and our, our private career colleges. In enhancing the care uh, tax credit, obviously child care is a, is a big expense uh, for Ontarians and we understand that. So in addition to our commitment to build 30,000 new child care spaces of which uh, you can expect investments coming uh, very soon to Brighton. Um, I'm working actively with the county on that. Uh, this, uh, the one time uh, top up for care tax credit, um, a, a typical family would, would benefit for about $1,500. This will benefit over 300,000 families in the province of Ontario. And obviously we see uh, with today's news from the feds, um, you know, we welcome any support for families. Obviously, the caveat in Ontario is we really want choice and flexibility for Ontarian families because the realities for shift workers, for rural Ontarian families, aren't the same as, as folks living at Young and Eglinton. So it's really important that we have flexibility in that. And, uh, and, and you can see both uh, your provincial and federal government taking meaningful steps in the right direction on that. The Tourism and Hospitality Small Business Support Grant. Obviously, the Ontario Small Business Support Grant has been critical. Uh, we've doubled that in the budget, and we're even looking at additional investments as we, as we speak now. Uh, but that's benefited a number of businesses. Uh, soon, I'll be able to provide the municipality with a list of businesses who've benefited from uh, Brighton. We're working actively with the number. I know um, you can all likely think of a few businesses
businesses off the top of your head that either have applied uh, or have received it. Um, in some instances, there were difficulties with respect to banking information or the name of a, of a, of a business, uh, your you know, CRA numbers with the RT number. Bill Ma up in, uh, in Hastings highlighted that for us. And I think, you know, this is part of the two-way street that politics is highlighting challenges. This is the largest business support program um, in Canadian history and has rolled out uh, in support of, of hundreds of thousands of, of businesses across our province. And the tourism piece now is new to the budget, recognizing that there are some unique challenges faced by RV campgrounds, um, BNBs. Uh, specifically, this was feedback straight from our community uh, went into this. And this is again up, um, up to between 10 and 20,000 eligible small businesses. As I said, hotels, motels, travel agencies, amusement and water parks, hunting and fishing camps, RV uh, camps, overnight children's camps. These are the sorts of things that are eligible and uh, that will be opening uh, very soon. The Community Building Fund on the topic of arts, culture, tourism, um, and this is where I'm asking for your help. I'm uh, challenging the municipality to really support me with this and our government in identifying our smaller non-for-profits. This is a brand new $105 million community building fund that will, over the next two years, support non-for-profit tourism uh, tourism and culture, sport, recreation organizations facing significant pressures due to the pandemic. The first stream is a $55 million operating stream. The second stream is a $50 million capital screen, uh, stream. So for more, um, reach out to my office. We can arrange a technical briefing. Why this matters, and if I think, for example, I'll highlight a very successful recipient in our riding, Critical Mass in Port Hope. I spoke to Miles Bowman, who's their grant writer, very skilled and has kindly offered his supports for any organization in Northumberland, um, but my office and the ministry is here to support as well. You know, it's really important. Not everybody has uh, a grant writer or someone with proficiencies in that, you know, someone with experience, perhaps from a city center with grant writing. So that's why it's really important for me to lean on you as, as, as leaders and as voices in your local community in Brighton to please identify some of these non-for-profits that you think would be eligible. Let me know. I'll, with you, we can schedule a technical briefing with the non-for-profit, with um, the sports club or organization and, uh, and their members, and, and we can walk through with the ministry exactly how to do it. There's uh, tutorials. We've really made it as accessible as possible, and it's really critical that uh, we make sure that these, these funds come to small town Ontario. Ontario. In addition um, to that, obviously, um, the resilient a communities fund through tourism, culture, and sports, some big changes made there. And, you know, a big a shout out to, for example, Colburn Legion, who highlighted the, some of the challenges there with respect to the audited requirements, the third party audited a financial statement, <coughs> amended that. And this is really that two way street, I think, to, you know, work that Paige uh, in my office here, who's joined me tonight, has done with local organizations. This quite literally is why the dialogue with your elected members matters. We changed that program, reduced the thresholds for audited financial statements, which has subsequently made a number of small non-for-profits eligible. The challenge they were facing was, Dave, why would I bother for this grant? I mean, paying to have an audited uh, review of our of our finances when you know CRA has already accepted them uh, it makes this cost prohibitive to apply so that's a, quite literally a small town change uh, made for this program uh, so I, I wanted to highlight that as well obviously in health protecting people's health another 1.8 billion invested to support our hospitals you obviously have seen my colleague uh, MPP Smith Minister Smith make significant announcements. Uh, into Quinty region and here um, Northumberland Hills Hospital received over a $5 million base funding increase that gives them the flexibility. Unfortunately, um, you know, over the previous decades, there was systemic underfunding for our hospitals and what that meant was, for example, the inpatient units had to be merged. We had nurses talking to me about walking around the hospital at the end of a shift just to decompress, knowing that they didn't provide the level of care that they needed or wanted to provide to that resident. So giving that flexibility, that was major for our small hospitals, Campbellford as well, and, uh, and Premier Ford of Australia made that announcement with me uh, in March uh, here locally. 
Uh, so that's a big, and while when we talk about expanding care, the massive transformation to long-term care is, is huge as well. And we're seeing that with shovels in the ground across our county. Um, the province uh, issued, um, obviously, a commitment to over 30,000 long-term care beds, new and developed. Uh, to put it in perspective, we have more long-term care, brand new, fully accessible, modern and safe spaces in our region than um, than we had in the last decade under the previous government. So this really speaks to the staggering investments in long-term care from a structural perspective, but also the commitment to hiring 27,000 long-term, uh, 27,000 healthcare professionals to support that and to make Ontario a national leader in direct hours of care for our loved ones in long-term care. Um, to do that, free PSW uh, courses, for example, through our public and, and private career colleges. I spoke to a mid-career uh, professional who reached out to my office and she said, Dave, I've taken the PSW training. I love uh, looking after others in my community and has really found a renewed purpose. And it's remarkable. And, and as we see the, the thanking of our healthcare heroes, big shout out to Brighton Legion for what they did. It was acknowledged uh, nationally in the press, um, acknowledging our healthcare heroes. Uh, we obviously see a new generation, not just young people, but mid-career professionals uh, looking to transition to work on the front lines. And, and that's thanks to our healthcare professionals. So uh, to support that, we've got the free PSW uh, training. We've launched standalone nursing for our, um, for our colleges. And why that matters is Loyalist no longer has to partner with a university in this old adage, a subservient sort of college viewpoint of things. This government has said that ends. We're working uh, very closely with our colleges. They can now offer standalone nursing. And if you think to the, the simulation training and what Loyalist does, I mean, they have one of the best programs. From my work at the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons prior, I had the opportunity to tour and they're doing some remarkable work out of Loyalist. So why does this matter? That means that that nursing student doing a practicum or placement or PSWs um, training uh, through the free tuition, they're gonna stay locally instead of losing them in those final years to more city centers uh, where universities traditionally um, set up shop. And, and that's gonna be huge for healthcare professions in our rural setting. Um, if protecting our uh, economy, uh, sorry, last thing on healthcare is the Colburn uh, Clinic. Ontario Health Teams, not a year later, we've launched community paramedicine which means that our healthcare professionals, I was talking to uh, the, the county uh, team today about this, are practicing their scope in a non-emergency setting. It's not just 911. It's now paramedics supporting people aging in place. This has been expanded and has been widely acknowledged as a very important practice. And why this matters, this isn't a, a partisan thing. This was something that the previous government looked at on a pilot basis, that our government grew and is now standardized across um, you know, across a, a litany of rural uh, municipalities. And this is, this is incredible for our paramedics to expand their scope of practice in a non-emergency setting. Rural Health Hub in Colburn, uh, we now finally have a rural health hub in a rural community that will cater to residents of Brighton as well. Mental health, chiropodists, um, supports uh, for a primary uh, clinicians as well. So this is gonna be really big in addressing hallway healthcare and uh, in, in the reformation I talked about earlier. Finally, uh, jobs training uh, tax credit. Um, you know, I, I spoke a bit of, about that. Our, our child benefit, we've extended for a third round of payments for the child benefit uh, for jobs. Um, as well, uh, we've invested another 400 million to support jobs training in hospitality and culture sectors. Um, and broadband, the, the, the final piece I wanted to address was broadband, a historic $4 billion commitment, the largest in Canadian history. And let's take a step back there. It's not, uh, you know, it, it, this is staggering for a province to make the large, this wasn't, this didn't come from any previous or current federal level. This came from the province, the largest commitment to broadband in Canadian history, $4 billion commitment. I know politicians and money announcements, let's see, let's see the action. So two intakes of ICON, stream one and two of which we're seeing the benefits in Brighton today. Rogers has expanded 5G. We've seen uh, a number of small internet service providers. We've seen the county make a submission uh, through the second wave of the ICON intake. So quite literally, 
these are projects with now shovels in the ground. And if you had any doubt about the efficacy of this going forward, I'll take you back to our broadband initiative that the province led the way on with the EORN project. And, and EORN, as, as you know, Mayor Ostrander just launched the, the, um, the tender for or the successful um, RFP went out and they now have shovels in the ground on that broadband on that uh, cellular cell gap project, which will address 99 or something percent of cell gaps. So it, it wasn't a coincidence where the province made that announcement was again locally um, in Ro Roseneath. If you pass Robin's convenience and you head down, I would always lose the call. I'm convinced I was at least speaking with one of you, I'm sure, over the last number of months where we've lost reception on that valley. And, and that's got to end for us, for, for a safety perspective, um, for accidents and emergency services, uh, for connectivity, for, for doing business, uh, for doing agriculture, it's critical. For aging in place, it's critical. For connecting the kids um, you know, to technology, it's critical. So that, uh, that, uh, that's a big piece. Um, in closing, some local announcements, fire grant, obviously $7,500 to Brighton Fire and Rescue. Our, uh, our, you know, our first responders have done such a phenomenal job through the pandemic, and especially, um, you know, I wanted to acknowledge the the fire uh, department for what they do. Um, you know, in a rural setting, training uh, is becoming, uh, you know, very costly. We're seeing, um, obviously, centers like Norwood and others. Our, our fire chiefs have done uh, some some great work uh, at the Northumberland uh, planning table. So, I want to give them credit uh, for that. Applefest Lodge received. Um, additional payments of over 33,000 to support with COVID. Uh, through infrastructure, Brighton received over 372,000 through the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund or OCIF for your roads and bridges. Through the Safe Restart Agreement, an additional $391,000 to support the municipality in dealing with COVID. OMPF, uh, you saw you know, additional investments as well through that. And um, I'm pleased uh, to wrap up uh, my remarks today by, by saying just in uh, today, Brighton has been successful through the resilient community stream for the pickleball courts. So very proud to announce that Brighton's going to be getting a brand new uh, pickleball uh, uh, courts in, in um, you know, for, for the residents. And, and I know that, you know, that's been a big priority for the community. Uh, credit to the team and staff that uh, put forward a great application for uh, council who've been advocating for that. I know that's going to be, um, you know, very important uh, for for the team and for the community. So, uh, with that, I'll uh, take any questions. And uh, again, I thank you all for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. Um, I, I really value it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Puccini. We uh, we appreciate you uh, coming to council, even if you uh, even if you did have to have to stay in Port Hope. We apologize for that. Um, it, things are always better in Brighton, as you know. Uh, I will open the floor to uh, members of council for questions of clarification. Council? Councillor Tadman. Thank you. Um, David, as uh, Doug, uh, Councillor Doug LeBlanc just embarrassed me by um, making an announcement. You probably already know that I'm very keen about conservation and I've been on the Lower Trent for a long time. Uh, what is your feeling about this? Uh, they call it the MT, MZO, the Ministerial Zoning Order. I find that uh, just overriding it, everything that the province mandates for the conservation areas that uh, a developer can just go to the top and, and uh, override anything that the conservation has to say about that. Is there going to be more thought put into that? I guess that's my question for tonight. Thanks, Councillor Tadman. I appreciate that and, and congratulations for the role. I know it is uh, important to you and, and, and we need uh, champions like yourself for our CAs and to advocate on their behalf. Uh, what I will say uh, to that uh, with respect specific to MZO, I think certainly, um, you know, there's been a very high profile with, with, with the Pickering project and uh, without question, you know, we had a council and the region move forward in support of that. Obviously some identified concerns and I think that unfortunately has given um, a bit of a, a bad characterization for MZOs, which I would say have been 
largely and very successfully used across the province of Ontario. Um, and they never get issued without the explicit request of the municipality. Uh, so that is uh, the municipality who I would add are also informed and have sitting councillors on conservation authorities who then vote um, in most cases unanimously for the utilization of the MZO. And it's a tool that the governments use to get critical local projects that people rely on located outside of the green belt. And that's very important outside of the green belt. Um, moving faster. And if I, if I highlight a few of the projects, there's been 3,700 long-term care beds accelerated through the use of MZOs, 1,000 affordable homes, uh, 26,000 new jobs created, the expansion of Sunnybrook Hospital, made in Ontario PPE facility. You saw, you've seen announcements with Linamar, um, the 3M facility, new modular housing units in Toronto, which have been widely publicized and the widely successful Cafe Keo program that provided a boost to the restaurant sector. So those are some of the things that MZOs have been used for. Um, that's not to dismiss uh, concerns. I, I take your, uh, you know, your comments there and reference one of the, the issues that has been widely publicized. But I think you know, often uh, you know, good news stories don't sell in the press as much as, as the other, uh, as, as the latter. So, um, we haven't seen all of those things that I mentioned uh, that have been, as I said, requested at unanimously from, from council. So it's been an important tool and we know Canada and specifically Ontario has been a laggard ranking something like 200 and something with respect to uh, getting shovels in ground for projects, which makes us fundamentally uh, uncompetitive uh, to more progressive jurisdictions like Denmark. The C.D. Howe Institute recently came out with a report on building permits. So I think, um, you know, I take your, your comment, but I, I do think that there have been a number of examples where they've been successfully used. And, and in all cases, it is always with the express direction of council and, uh, and, and usually the upper tier as well. Can I follow okay. up on that? Uh, as long as you're not engaging in debate, yes, you may. Oh, I'm not debating. Um, I know the rules, uh, Mayor. Um, it's just, I know you brought a lot of examples where it, it works well, but my concern has always been that um, that the the actual uh, policies of the of provincial government rule what the conservation area uh, conservation people. That's how they make their uh, final uh, approval or or denial of a place and. Uh, and they definitely don't want to see uh, buildings go in the wetland. The, the, the ones that you used as examples, I don't think they would be in a wetland um, when you're talking about seniors' homes and, and things like that. So that, that's always my concern that we can, we've lost so much wetland in the last 50 years. So I think it more than ever, it needs to be protected. And especially now as we see the flooding and the, and the different changes in the climate. So thanks, yeah. um, and, I, and I'll just keep a watch on that because it, it does concern me. You know, it's a, you're, you're absolutely right about a source water protection. And I think uh, part of the government's amendments and some of the recent investments have really been targeted for water, source water protection, wetland protection, uh, some recent uh, investments to date that I can share offline from the government to support that. And, and you're, you are right, they play a vital role in that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from members of council? Council of Law? You're muted, Doug. Okay. Two questions, uh, your, Mayor, your Worship. Uh, for for uh, for the MPP, one is the tax credit up to five hundred thousand. Does that money have to be spent first and show the receipts, or can it be verified for the equipment to be purchased and help that money to purchase the equipment? Because when I qualified for a couple of these, I actually had to show that the equipment was actually per per purchased and on site, or can the government help to purchase the equipment to bring it on site? to stimulate some of these smaller business that can't qualify for the loans from the banks or tier one banks uh, to buy this equipment to get them going or to upgrade to create more jobs. So this is my understanding, this is uh, to support capital investments, but uh, 
to your point about equipment and other things, there are other provincial programs. I, I think uh, locally of some successful equipment purchased at Algoma Orchards, for example, uh, through provincial funding where that funding came prior uh, to the purchase. So there are some other streams at Councillor LeBlanc that we can uh, tap into in advance of the purchase, but this, uh, my understanding and, and Paige, feel free to jump in if I'm incorrect, but it, it is after the purchase, um, you'll get the credit uh, that tax year. Yeah, my second question. My second question is uh, uh, communicating with the public when the public or the residents or, their, or your constituents do you uh, contact you and get you to, for information or for advice once they've tried through the government to get results. Like, do you... In your team, do you participate in helping the residents get the questions answered so they can get a question answered? Yes, um, we've had uh, obviously reached out, you know, extensively to uh, small businesses. I know um, that all of you have been very active on, on identifying, you know, small businesses that need additional support. And so we're always available to answer questions if you're not getting it through the direct line. Um, you know, I, I would say the most common call we're getting right now is about vaccine booking. Um, everybody's very eager, obviously, a delayed Moderna shipments. Um, what we're hearing now, uh, we're not actually going to get a full Moderna shipment till the end of May now, which is unfortunate. And uh, AstraZeneca, which is now delayed as well, which makes things difficult. But inevitably, when I call the constituent back, usually... Uh, the call goes something as follows. Oh, I called you this morning and I called them back that night or the next day and they say, oh, well, I, I actually got through and I did book. And so that's usually how they're going. I understand people are frustrated and patient. They want the booking as of yesterday. Um, but a couple things. One, uh, you never want to me measure a litmus test based on not crashing, but Ontario is one of the few jurisdictions that actually had an online web tool that never crashed. Again, I know it's a, that's nothing to take pride in, but uh, in addition, the 1-800 number for vaccine supports um, has had over double the amount of agents that California has uh, with over double our population. So uh, there's a lot of supports there. And, and certainly to answer your question directly, Councillor LeBlanc, my office is here. If you ever don't get an answer or not the answer you're looking for or need help, that's my job is to get you that answer, advocate on, your, on, on one's behalf and support them. Is that a follow-up, Councillor LeBlanc? Yes, one more question. I, I, I apologize for the MPP for getting three questions in. Okay. Uh, but my third one is, I, I really appreciate the $100,000 announcement for the pickleball court, which is within our built-up area. But we have an active rural area, which is Codrington Farmer's Market, I believe. And the, um, Mr. Miller applied for a, a grant for uh, $25,000 for a sign that would help us in tourism and letting them know what's going on in the rural area. I was wondering how that was coming forward. I'll take that as a follow-up. Um, Councillor, I know you've been very uh, aggressive in the support for the pickleball court. Um, I think that's great news. The sign and Codrington, I know, um, you know, we, we've got very important rural segments of our, our municipalities and I'll take that uh, offline and follow up. It is one we're, we're monitoring and I've pushed for. I'll, uh, I will be able to follow up with you offline. And unfortunately, I didn't have an answer on that envelope for tonight's, uh, tonight's council meeting. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. MPP. Appreciate Thank it. you for that. And while we're on the grant conversation, uh, Mr. Buccini, we also are, um, I'm, I'm understanding we're waiting to hear on the summer experience program grant and the uh, rural economic development, the red grant. Um, both of those are uh, for projects or for, um, for some ones for a summer student, ones for a project here in Brighton. I'm wondering if you could help with that. Yes, absolutely, uh, Your Worship. I know you've been uh, spoken on a number of occasions on, on the red and rural economic development, really important, and I appreciate that. It is on my radar, and uh, I unfortunately don't have an update for tonight, uh, but I will follow up with you on that. In addition, obviously, I know, um, you know there are a variety of issues. I, you know, I had the opportunity to tour um, the, you know, the wastewater facility with you um, as well recently. So I very much know the priorities for the community and, and appreciate, uh, and I'll follow up with you on, on, the, on the, summer, um, the summer grant program and the, and the Rural Economic Development Fund. 
Thank you. We, we appreciate that. And, and, for, and for everything you helped uh, with regard to the wastewater uh, treatment plant, um, getting us the time we needed uh, with, with ministerial staff, it's, that's appreciated as well. Uh, so that we can do this right and, and right the first time. Any other questions from members of council? Surprise, Ron doesn't have a question for me. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Okay, Ron, you don't have to have one. I just like to say something. It's really nice to see you here, uh, David, and uh, I, a lot of good stuff happening out there. And I, I'm glad to see our governments are starting to work together. It seems like they're crossing the path to, to uh, you made some good comments about the budget today. And you also show that uh, some of the things that uh, both you know, federal and provincial are making some things happen in the, in, in, in uh, internet, broadband, that type of thing. And there was another announcement today of more money that's gonna come our way, meaning the province and, and uh, the country, but, uh, so I think working together is getting things done, and I appreciate uh, what you're doing. And if you could bring some uh, some more uh, funds to our community, uh, we're in the eastern part of the, the county, and uh, I know you're not county, but it, we all work together, right? So anything you can do and uh, uh, is appreciated. So I won't I won't put you on the spot. No, thanks, Council Anderson. You're right. It is important. And these difficult times, people don't care what level of government. They just want to know that their supports are there and that they're getting answers to their questions. So you're spot on about that. I know sometimes politics uh, do uh, get in the way. There's a bit of politicking, um, but uh, but you're right uh, that we all have to work together um, to support our, our residents and, and you're spot on. I mean, I think it is worth noting, I, while I didn't have the chance to pour through the budget, I think it's really important that a federal government who have access to, to big envelopes of money work in synergy. The Resilient Communities Fund is a great example of us pushing for flexibility. The Fed's more than willing to accommodate, and we've seen some great projects as a result. And I know um, an application you know, here uh, was uh, successful as a result. So that's a great example of all three levels of government. And I've got to say, I know, um, you know when I first took office, uh, certainly to today, a marked increase. I mean, the, the number of times I, you know, that council's been advocating in Brighton, uh, it's, it's really appreciated um, at all of the work you're all doing. Um, and, and it's been noticed too, uh, within uh, multiple ministries, uh, really putting Brighton on the map. And I, I'm excited for the next year, economic recovery in our community, um, and really hitting uh, the east, east portion of our county. That's great. The only way it's going to get done, right? Exactly. Thanks a lot. Thank you both for that. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Vicini, for joining us here at Brighton Council. We appreciate the update and the uh, the um, high level yet deep dive into some of the uh, issues in the budget that uh, that are relevant to the municipality. So it's, it's very much appreciated. And with that, members of council, I'll need a mover that council receives the presentation from David Vicini, member of provincial parliament, 2021 provincial budget update. Moved by Deputy Mayor Vink, seconded by Councillor LeBlanc. Is there any discussion on the motion? Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Councillor Ron Anderson. Members Ron of Council, you're, you're muted. Some of you, anyway. Oh, now he's gone. Okay, he'll come back, don't worry. Broadband. <laughs> no. Fingers. Yeah. Mute. Just a second. There, there you go. You got me? You got yeah. me. Did I say no? Oh, um, yes. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Mark Bateman. Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc. Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley. Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman. Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink. Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. It's carried. Thank you. Thank you all for the discussion. And uh, thank you, Mr. Puccini, again for joining us. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, Your Worship. Thank you, uh, Council, for having me tonight. Take care. Take care.
Our next delegation is from Doug Stevenson, Bay of Quinney Regional Marketing Board. And Mr. Stevenson, I saw you there a second ago. There you are. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. I'm just going to bring up my presentation. Uh, thank you, Mayor Ostrander, Council, uh, and staff for having me here tonight. Can everybody see that presentation all right? Can. Terrific. Thank you very much. Uh, so, I'm very excited to start this presentation off, uh, much like the excitement I had a few years ago when Brighton joined this partnership, we've recently brought on Greater Napanee to join the Bay Quinney Regional Marketing Board. And uh, they reached out to us a few months ago. We had some discussions back and forth. Both parties, including our board of directors, felt it was a great fit. And uh, like I said, we're all very excited about this. We feel like this Bay of Quinty region has been bookended and uh, Napanee's really got a lot of uh, strong assets uh, that's gonna help us market this region, uh, especially as we come out of COVID-19 and it gets us that much closer to Kingston, gets us that much closer to the Quebec border, uh, two demographics we're really trying to attract. So we're, uh, like I said, we're very excited about that. Uh, before I get into uh, to everything, I just want to talk about some successes right off the top. You know, we all know 2020 was extremely difficult, a worldwide pandemic. You could never predict something like this. Uh, I think many of you on council and on staff have found I'm an optimist. I try to be optimistic about these things. So I'm, I'm trying to pull out some of the successes from 2020. If you look at the national data from CBRE who collect hotel data from all across this country, you know, our Bay of Quinty region had the lowest occupancy loss in all of Canada at 9%. Typical occupancy loss across Canada, minus 31%. Across Southeastern Ontario, minus 21%. So of course, was it a great year? No, it was a very challenging year, but we're very happy to be pulling a, a stat out like that. And similarly, on the resident attraction side of things, our other mandate, you know, we have never seen a year this hot since I've been with the Regional Marketing Board. Uh, Quinney District Association of Realtors 2020 data shows great sales increases. Uh, and also, uh, while dollar, dollar volumes up 40%, average price is only up 23%. So that that's uh, uh, good numbers for us. I've never had as many realtors tell me that so many folks from the city have been coming here and buying homes. This was the strategy that we started selling, you know, six, seven years ago. And it's really coming to fruition now. And COVID has put a bit of a lens on this. Now, do I feel like average prices are getting a bit high? I do. And in fact, I think that the way average prices are going up, it's risking one of our most competitive advantages, which is that low price, drawing people in here to move to our community to support our tax base. So we've got to do more in order to try and normalize that by enhancing the building that's going on at a community level. And hopefully things will start to normalize as we come out of the pandemic. When we look at our last fiscal year, here's the funding scenario. So we were working with a budget a little over 800,000. So you'll see yourselves, Municipality of Brighton up in the top right corner there, uh, 155 per capita for a total of $18,358. It's about 2.2% of our total funding. Your money at work. Well, we took a quarter of that funding and we gave it right back to you on this top section right here, helping to fund your shop local, doing some staycation giveaways, uh, funding for some of the marketing initiatives that Ben has been driving forward so well, uh, and also a marketing grant for the Brighton Crammy Chamber of Commerce to develop a new heritage product. So when we look at economic impact that our marketing had in 2020, 2021, it was strong. Uh, in fact, greater than our entire budget. So great ROI because uh, of that budget, not the whole thing is for marketing. So uh, we had some really strong uh, economic activity from the programmatic and digital that we did on our three major campaigns, Alfresco, which was trying to get people to do things outside in the fair weather during the pandemic, our staycation sweepstakes, 
which was giving away $500 staycations for eight weeks straight to local residents, try and encourage them to get out across this region and explore. And our Take a Drive campaign, which was our always on campaign, trying to attract people to drive here in and within our communities safely and experience this region. We we're also successful in receiving federal funding over $275,000 through this office. And some of the marketing metrics are, are great numbers for us. Uh, almost 450,000 web visits, our social media and digital followings now over 50,000. Uh, we worked across 34 different projects from a marketing point of view and had total campaign impressions over 3 million. Here's the team right here that makes it happen. I love working with this team uh, every week. They work very hard. Uh, they care about this community. They care about Brighton. They work closely with Ben. So it's myself, Trevor Norris, Jen Achilles and Courtney Klumper. When we look at your funding and how it worked in 2020, 2021, again, like I mentioned, we worked across 34 different marketing projects and tactics. Our newest project, the Bay Quinney Marketing Grants, was something that we're really proud of. With COVID-19, we wanted to support the tourism industry through marketing as much as we could. So we took $55,000 and we awarded 26 different projects. One of which came from Brighton Crammy. There was only one eligible application. We're gonna work with Ben to get more applications in the current spring round that we're doing right now. Uh, and like I mentioned, Sherry from the chamber applied for and was successful to get $3,500 to develop a Brighton heritage map. So right now we're currently accepting applications for a spring intake of the marketing grant. We've earmarked 80,000 for two intakes this year, a spring and a fall. We're hoping we can actually increase that number based on municipal accommodation tax funding through the summer. We'll see how that goes. And like I mentioned, we're gonna be working with Ben to try and get more applications coming from Brighton, including from the Brighton BIA, which Ben and I have spoken. I mentioned our campaigns, the three majors, the staycation, our take a drive, the alfresco. Just wanna share a quick quote from our staycation campaign. So there was a lucky Brighton staycation winner, for example. So a $500 staycation to spend in Brighton overnight and another amenity. So the winner says, Earl and I had a nice time away at the Brighton staycation. Everything was perfect. Sunflower Health was a great place. Whistling Duck was really nice. Good food. Sobeys always has everything I want. The Timber House Resort was a very nice and friendly place to stay. Enjoyed our evening with live music, wonderful breakfast. Bought a few things in a couple of the other stores in Brighton too. Thanks again for everything. So that's from, from Vanda Spencer. And I wanna draw your eyes just to the bottom of this slide. One thing we do with our marketing campaigns is tracking. So you've heard of cookies, you know, online, if you, for example, type in a search term for golf, well, you might notice if you're on the Globe and Mail news site that golf ads are following you around. Those are those cookies and we use those as well. People click on our stuff and we're able to, to see where they click from there. So we're able to see that we referred almost 3000 people clicking our ads to other websites. So other stakeholders and businesses, for example, from Brighton. We also have the ability to track because most people have their GPS on, on, on these cell phones. Uh, over 8,000 entries from people who clicked on our ads and then went somewhere uh, that we have geofenced. So attractions, restaurants, hotels, uh, places we're trying to send people on behalf of our campaign. So we're really excited about how we're, we've been driving people uh, physically as a result of our marketing. Our websites, uh, as I mentioned, almost 450,000 in total traffic in 2020, great growth from the year before. A lot of that's driven by our tourism and our living blogs where we're telling stories every week about things that are going on in Brighton, for example, from a tourism, tourism and from a resident perspective. Similarly on social media, we're seeing some great numbers. Uh, like I mentioned, our following now uh, up over 52,000, 13% growth from last year. And similarly, it's storytelling. It's our Facebook Live campaigns. It's nice visuals like the lighthouse here. It's getting out and visiting things when we could do it in the campaign or in the pandemic, like getting to Cricklewood Farm with the team as part of our, our campaigns through the summer months. And our discovery guide, our flagship project, we just released it uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, on April 9th and uh, 
printed 20,000 copies. Right now, the release is only digital. We have uh, physical copies ready to go that we're going to get out uh, as soon as we can. But right now, while the measures are as they are in the province of Ontario, we're holding back on physical distribution. Similarly, we really drove video this year. Of course, we kept going with our Facebook Live campaign. We also did a time-lapse video series of things uh, like conservation areas, excuse me, like the one you'll see there for Proctor Park. We did one for downtown Brighton. And we also worked with Paula from Docs by the Bay to create a doctor recruitment uh, video. So it features medical practitioners from Brighton and from Coney West, as well as uh, uh, sizzle video from both communities in order to try and entice people so that when Paul is out there uh, doing her missions and, and trying to sell new medical professionals to come and, and make a life in our community, she has this video as a tool and we're really happy with the final result. Again, also with photography, this is something we sit down at the beginning of the year and we say, you know, Ben, what would you like to have photography of? So we work with him to figure out locations we did 10 Brighton photography sessions in 2020, 2021. We're gonna be doing a similar program again this year. So Ben's gonna be coming at us with new ideas. And the idea is we pay for it based on the partnership and we give them to Ben so he can use them however he wants or he can share them with stakeholders. We also worked throughout the year to do paid media. So we did two different campaigns, one with post media, one with in Quinty. We're gonna continue those again this year. We saw some great numbers as you'll see from the the data over on the right hand side of the slide there we also brought influencers in uh, from the region so for example the article that you can see there about visiting brighton for the ultimate lakeside getaway and we had some some great recognition and that felt really good we were recognized by the economic developers council of ontario with two provincial awards uh, one for our immigration documentary another for one of the campaigns that we did and also recognized at a national level from the Economic Developers Association of Canada, again, for our immigration documentary and also for our staycation sweepstakes. So those are things we're really proud of. Um, and, but at the end of the day, it's getting back and focusing and especially working our way through this pandemic. So we've just had our board of directors, uh, your own deputy mayor, Laura Vink, who's a part of that. Thanks so much, Laura, for all you do as a member of our board, uh, just approved our, our new business plan you can see our priorities here for 20 and 21 or for 21, 22. The budget that we're working with a uh, little bit less than what we had the past year. Uh, obviously, municipal accommodation tax with uh, Belleville and Quinney West is affected uh, by hotel stays during the pandemic, but we're going to drive things forward. Another thing I want to bring to your attention, you know, when we uh, did this partnership a few years ago, we signed an MOU where we said we were actually gonna increase the funding by 25 cents per capita every year. Uh, we, we haven't done that. We've left it at the 155 per capita uh, that you signed on to two years ago. Uh, so instead of putting an extra 9,000 or so on by now, it's still 18,000 and change. That'll be the same for this current year as we move forward in 2021, 2022. And next steps, as I finish up, we're activating this business plan now as I mentioned, we're expanding our marketing grants. We've got two intakes. Uh, we've all already gotten 24 applications and we just opened them up last week. Uh, new funding program as well for BIA support. So we created this actually using municipal accommodation tax funds. So what we said was we're gonna take 10% of municipal accommodation tax funds from Quinney West. And we're gonna work with their BIA to create marketing support and capacity funding their marketing initiatives, because at the end of the day, it supports our mandate. Our downtowns are, are some of our greatest assets. So why shouldn't we take some of this hotel tax money and inject it back? We're doing the same thing with Belleville. We're taking 10% of that mat tax, giving it to their downtown, creating a marketing plan with them and working with them to support that plan. So though you haven't created a municipal accommodation tax bylaw in the municipality of Brighton, we're still going to give $1,000 to your BIA to start off in that same direction. And I hope we'll be able to talk more about municipal accommodation tax as the year goes on. I know I've pitched this before. I think it's an excellent opportunity for the community. Some of my draft numbers show somewhere between, uh, you know, $50,000 and $70,000 uh, to be 
to be had based on municipal accommodation tax for both parties. We're also developing an experiential tourism strategy in collaboration with your staff. So that's gonna be kicking off next month. Of course, continued comprehensive marketing campaigns and they have to flex depending on what's going on. You know, right now we can't necessarily tell people to go to certain places, but we're still telling those stories of all the different stakeholders in our community. It's still an opportunity to do that. And we've got a new campaign we're actually gonna be releasing in the coming weeks uh, while we're in this a bit of a lockdown as a result of COVID-19. And ultimately, the whole point is to get back to this stuff. We want to drive economic impact. We want to support what you're doing through Ben and his office, who, by the way, is a workhorse. That guy is driving so many projects forward. He has created a terrific foundation for marketing on the municipality, not just from tourism and resident attraction that we work with, but all over the place benefiting the municipality. He's building your social media accounts, he's building your followings, but maybe more importantly, we're, we're seeing him build all the partnerships with the BIA, with the businesses, and with us. He supports me and my staff on a weekly basis. We couldn't have a better guy in the chair over there. So thank you so much, Ben, for all you do. It's been terrific working with you and we're gonna do it again this year. Speaking of thank yous, thank you on behalf of our Bay Quinney team. This is out, us out on an experience uh, in Quinney West. And of course, uh, you can get a hold of me anytime. Here's my contact information, but I'm happy to take questions right now. Thank you, Doug. You're always a whirlwind, thank you. Um, <laughs> E-transfer's on its way, Doug. <laughs> it's, uh, it is always appreciated. Are there any um, questions of clarification for members of council? Councillor Anderson. Hi, Doug. How you doing? Good. Thanks for uh, being here. A great, uh, great presentation. I've seen some of it before, but uh, I heard today in the uh, federal budget, so since we, it's a very political night, so there's a <laughs> There's a pile of information, uh, pile of uh, funding coming towards tourism out of this budget. Uh, they recognize that hospitality has been hit hard hit, uh, restaurants, uh, bars, and uh, hotels, all that has been hit really hard. So there's a lot of funding coming, and I presume it will come through channels like through through you, and through the municipalities. I hopefully, but uh, also through you of which you'll be able to do even more when we come out of this. And is that what you would gather? Is that, is that the stream that it would go? I hope so. That's what happened last year. I read a bulletin tonight from the Tourism Industry Association or Tourism Industry Association of Canada. They didn't mention anything specifically for destination marketing organizations like ourselves. They mentioned, to your point, Councillor, a lot of different measures through various uh, entry points, a lot of them being small businesses. And I mean, those are all excellent, right? At the end of the day. And uh, I know MPP Pacini talked a lot about this, but there were a lot of really strong supports for tourism in the Ontario budget as well. Nothing, nothing for destinations. Um, so we're kind of crossing our fingers, I guess, and hoping that they're going to do the same thing that they did last year. Uh, you know, again, for us, where we derive a large portion now of our funding through municipal accommodation tax, it can be really tricky. You know, where people aren't staying right now, right, is where you used to work, is in the hotels. And uh, that means well, that, uh, that tax- some of, them are, some of them are doing all right. I, I, I yeah. talked to you, okay? Yeah. So it's not a total wipeout. No, yeah. It's, I guess what I'm trying to say is uh, <laughs> that federal funding was certainly uh, a real boost for us, where we were down probably 150 to 160,000 last year and what we would have seen in municipal accommodation tax had it not been a pandemic year. But yeah, we're hopeful. I would like to, you know, just touch on it. That's something I'd like to see us move on. But, uh, and you brought it up at an economic development uh, uh, meeting that we had. Uh, I think it's a good time to hold back on that. We could start talking policy and that type of thing, but I don't think it'd be a very good time to launch something like that. So uh, this community certainly could do it. I know there's a lot of uh, uh, accommodations out there that uh, it, I'm sure they'd be happy to support. 
um, a program like this. So anyway, we'll talk about that later. Thanks for uh, all you're doing. Thank you. Thank you both, Councilor LeBlanc. Well, thank you very much for all the good news. And I'm glad that this council three years ago made a decision to uh, rehire uh, economic development uh, staff. And good good news for Ben. He deserves a swell head after listening to all this good news dur during uh, uh, COVID. And I took interest into one of your uh, numbers, which was 8,200 some odd that were hits on maps that came into your region. And if they, I just quick numbers, if they spend $10, $10 that's over 800,000. If they spent $100, that's over $8 million. So even if they spend $10 in driving through here, buying gas and stuff, they stimulated our economy for the money that, and the tax dollars that are going in. And also all the small businesses that you guys are helping, which needed during this COVID. I really appreciate it. And I know you're, you. you're up, but uh, thank you for being up in, in all these downtowns with the COVID and everything coming up. So thank you. Yeah, Good and, and yeah, we're really happy to have seen those numbers. Like I said, I mean, it's... It's neat to be able to track that sort of thing, you know, nowadays, uh, but also it, it just makes you feel like things are working, which are, you know, that's, that's a good feeling. So thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. And I just want to say that um, I'm constantly amazed at uh, what uh, the Bay of Quinney Marketing Board can do with our measly $18,000 that we send them and compared to some of the other things that we pay for. Um, I'm just thankful for, for what we're getting um, out of it. And I really do see the benefit to Brighton. Thank you. You bet. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Councilor Rowley. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Doug. Always good to see you. Likewise. Um, my, my question is regarding the uh, $1,000 marketing support for DBAs. Would you or one of your staff uh, be willing to join us at a meeting to explain uh, how that will work? Uh, can I s connect a, an email address for, to you uh, as far as our new administrator for the DBIA so that we can maybe set up something um, for this later on? Yeah, Ben and I were cooking up a plan to um, have some discussions. So Let's include Ben on that, but certainly, anytime. Certainly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'll forward the new contact information. Thank Please. You. Thanks, That's Doug. exciting. Thank you both. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much, Doug. I think uh, it's fairly obvious that the economic impact of our partnership is uh, is coming to fruition here in Brighton. I appreciate the work you and your team are doing and what you're doing to help us and our municipal team uh, the team of one that is uh, Mr. Hagerman uh, in economic development. But uh, for everything you've been doing for Brighton, uh, thank you very much. Appreciate you bet. It. Thanks for being a part of the partnership. And thanks for having me tonight. Happy weekend. Be safe. Be well. And with that, I have a motion that Council receive the presentation from Doug Stevenson, Bay of Quinney Regional Marketing Board update on behalf of the Bay of Quinney Regional Marketing Board partnership with the municipality. Is there a mover? Moved by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Rowley. Is there any discussion on the motion? Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Councilor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councilor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councilor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councilor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councilor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. It's carried. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Doug. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, that takes us to citizens comment. Madam Clerk, are you aware of anyone joining us or who has sent you a um, message to be related I, to citizens comment? I've not received anything. Thank you. Taking us into staff reports. Our first report is with regard to wet conditions at the municipal dog park. Mr. Miller, we have read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight, sir? Um, just highlight the fact that it, it's just not drying up there. And I believe uh, Director Park, Preston Parkinson was going to say a few words on it. Parkinson? Through your worship. Yeah, we've developed a bit of a plan. Um, in that 10,000 includes fixing the entrance up to get the culvert at the proper elevation, uh, enlarging the parking lot, 
uh, creating a ditch to try to intercept water all the way around the dog park itself and then some interior drainage to try to get the water in a little quicker and then the addition of some material within the dog park. And what are our, um, what's our hope for success here? Well, I think it's, the hope is, is it's going to happen. It's going to be a success. Um, definitely. I mean, you know, we have to make it work. There's a lot of people that are dependent on it. And uh, I believe we'll I, I, it at the end. I just know it's a, it's a low lying area and you know, yeah, it's a very low lying area when you drive around. It's yeah. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the um, motion reads that the municipality of Brighton Council authorized staff to fix the drainage situation at the municipal dog park. The council authorized staff to transfer up to ten thousand dollars from the recreation reserve account to fund this project. Is there a mover? Is there a seconder? Deputy Mayor Ving. Is there any discussion from members of council? Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad to, to hear that it includes a few other things like fixing the um, the parking lot and the ditch. It just seems like a lot of money, $10,000. I really hope that we can do it for less than that. Uh, I do notice that later on in our agenda, we talk about uh, roadside tree removal and trimming. Maybe we can shred that up, uh, chip that up and put it in the dog park as well. I don't know if that's a possibility. Um, uh, it's something that they have done in other dog parks uh, in order to uh, help with the um, the uh, mud and, and that sort of thing because grass of course doesn't really grow when dogs run around on it all the time so um, I'm, I'm in support of this but I sure do hope that we it can come in um, at a, a lesser cost. Thank you Deputy Mayor. Mr. Miller did you have a comment on that? Well yeah um, we, we did try a bit of uh, chips but the trouble is if the water's laying there all it does is just soak into the chips and yeah. uh, depending on who you, you know where you read a lot of people do not recommend chips because what it does is it contains um, you know uh, impediments and you know discreetment and everything else in in the park it doesn't drain it stays right in the chips so there's a lot of places uh, that don't recommend you using chips um, so that's why we want to try to get the drainage uh, situation fixed. Thank you, Councillor Cadman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I was just uh, told again this morning that there's a problem with the uh, small dogs and the fence. Uh, they, they, some of them have found a way of getting under the fence. And uh, so those people can no longer use the dog park because it's so close to County Road 64 and the little guys run right out onto 64 and that'd be very dangerous. So I don't know what you can do about it, but certainly somehow the fencing probably needs to be adjusted. I see the director made some notes there. Thank you very much for that. Right, Councillor Anderson. Okay, um, Jim, how long is the agreement for the, for the, uh, the contract? Well, the original agreement, I believe, is for 10 years. So, but, and it's just only been a year now, roughly, right? A year or two? Yes, yes. So I think the expense, uh, if you keep it below 10,000, would be uh, appropriate to, uh, you know, maintain it for another eight years or so, or hopefully longer, but you know what if it was only a three-year contract five years or something i'd be saying we should uh, be watching where we're spending the money but anyhow i think it would be i will support it tonight based on uh, what you've got here thank you councillor leblanc yes uh i also with this because the dog park's been closed some of the large property owners like mr dunnett have allowed a lot of the uh dog owners to walk the, uh, hit their dogs through his apple orchard and everything. So thanks to him and the other large property owners that have filled in a huge void. And also for the drainage, uh, the dog park, that used to be a, an old potato field and it holds water. That's why they grew potatoes there. But what it did, they had a ditch to the west and the ditch is all silted in right now. And like most of our, uh, our ditches uh, needed some brushing and then you can see the ditch, the swale that comes out right beside our parking lot. 
And possibly if that, that was dug down, it would help out in the drainage of the whole dog park because you could dig it down about a foot and a half if it's filled up. Just it, it'd help out, it'd let it drain. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor LeBlanc. I'm sure the uh, staff made some notes there. Councillor Bateman? Yeah, I was just going to ask when you're reading it, it says 7,500 to 10,000, depending on how much of the work can be done in house or contracted out. Have we determined? What level? You won't know that until you get started on it. Well, basically, yeah, we'll find out when once we get started what all we need, whether we need to bring in, uh, you know, high ho or we need to bring in some, some equipment um, and on an operator, uh, which we don't have in public works. It's all going to be dependent, even material, bringing material in. We will get. We'll, we will, I assume, get a report back on uh, the expenditure that did take place here. Sure. Thank you. Appreciate that. Anything further, Councilor Bateman? Yeah, just a follow up. So, is there a chance that when the report comes back, depending on how much work has to be contracted out, are we sure that that is going to be enough? I know it was mentioned it'd be nice to have it lower, but if we don't know what's needed. 10,000 might not be enough, depending on what they say, correct? Mr. Miller? Could be, it could very well be, but we, we think $10,000 is, is a good good right. number. Deputy Mayor? It's coming out of the Recreational Reserve Fund. So um, I just want to ensure that it's not necessarily coming out of ta tax dollars and it's uh, this fund how much is in that fund and what is it usually used for? I believe right now it's about $48,000 and it is used for, um, you know, projects such as this, which come up. Um, it's also uh, reserve funds for equipment or whatnot that we've earmarked over the years to replace. Thank you, Councillor Rowley. Uh, no, my my question was the same as the deputy mayor as far as uh, the reserve fund money. Glad to see it's not coming out of taxes. That's all. Thank you, Thank you Councilor Long. Yes, uh, Your Honor. Uh, last year there was a couple of fundraisers. I know for one I was involved with at Polybogs. I don't know if that money was sent or collected, but I will talk to them. They'll be setting up back on the first of May, and that was close to five hundred dollars. And I think there was another one that was sent uh, to Linda Whitfield. So it possibly is a thousand dollars that was sent in through uh, uh, fundraisers that they had last year. Okay. Thank you. Anything further from members of council? Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Councillor Ron Anderson. Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman. Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc. Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Pradman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. That's carried. Thank you. Our next staff report is with regard to the skateboard park project update. Mr. Miller, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? Um, yes, I'd like to uh, highlight the, the fact that uh, the opening that I do have in the report May 7th is not going to happen due to the uh, provincial uh, extension of the lockdown. So at this point in time, um, we, are, we do not have a date yet. Um, there still has to be landscaping uh, completed and uh, I'm checking with our contractor uh, to see if that's going to be delayed. So uh, everything else except for the opening date is is, is good with the, in the report. I've, uh, I've changed the, uh, the motion because of uh, this verbal recommendation and the motion will read that council receives a staff report regarding, a, regarding the opening of the new municipal skateboard park at a date to be determined. Is there a mover? But Councilor Rowley? Seconded by Councillor Anderson. Discussion? Adam, oh, go ahead, Councillor Bateman. Just a question for Mr. Miller. The, the contractor, they're out of province contractor, correct? Yeah, they're out of Chilliwack. 
Mm. Yeah. So with the with, with the restrictions, even if they lift them, if they don't lift the travel ban, you could be looking a lot longer unless we. Well, no, they have staff here in the in Ontario. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, they, so they have local people to do that. Okay, I thought they had to come up out of problems. Gotcha. Thank no. you. Any other questions, Councillor Anderson? You're you're okay, Ron. Okay, I just. Uh, I know landscapers are working, so whether they're working against any, I don't know if they can work, but I just know a lot of them are working. So it, it may not be a problem getting that landscaping done, but getting an open, yes, may be the other problem. But I know, Jim, that's all I know. We're not permitted to open or have skateboard skate parks open during the uh, most recent announcement, so it would be a bit... Um, I think counterintuitive if we had a grand opening. Oh, but the, uh, the work, but the work still work be. can be done. Yeah, I think the work can be done, but uh, we we will have to keep the skateboard park closed. And no, fair enough. Yeah. Any further comments or questions, members of council? Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Councilor Ron Anderson. Yes. Councilor Mark Bateman. Yes. Councilor Doug LeBlanc. Yes. Councilor Emily Rally. Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman. Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink. Mayor Brian Ostrander. Yes. It's carried. Thank you. Our next staff report is with regard to the Environmental Advisory Committee. Mr. Walsh, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight, sir? Uh, through your worship, nothing more to add. Thank you. And the motion reads that council received the staff report regarding the formation of an Environmental Advisory Committee. And the council establish a sustainability advisory working committee that would generally be a self-directed project-oriented working group reporting to council on an annual basis. Is there a mover? Moved by Deputy Mayor Vink, seconded by Councillor Bateman. Questions or comments from members of council? Deputy Mayor. You for this report. I think it's a good idea to establish a, a sustainability advisory working committee rather than an actual um, ad, advisory committee. Or uh, um, I think this works better and something that is self-directed, um, uh, I think for this type of committee um, is appropriate, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So I'm glad to see this as an option in the report. Thank you. Anyone else? Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rally? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. It's carried. Thank you. Our next the report is with regard to a pool and closure bylaw. And Mr. Walsh, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight here? Uh, nothing further, Your Worship. So members of Council, we have two options uh, laid out before you. Uh, one is to receive, essentially receive the staff report and uh, note that we do not wish to pursue a bylaw at this time. Um, the other is to uh, seek a legal opinion and carry on down another road. So I'll ask for a mover and let me know which one you'd like to go and then I'll read the motion. Councillor Tadman. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to receive the report. Is there a seconder to receive? So moved by Councillor Tadman, seconded by Councillor Rowley. The council received the staff report regarding pool enclosure bylaw and the council does not pursue enacting a pool enclosure bylaw at this time. Is there any discussion? Deputy Mayor. I have a bit of a problem with just receiving it. Um, I understand there's a liability issue, but I think every time we create a bylaw, there's a liability issue because then we're liable to make sure that people follow it. Um, but it's not like a, un, unlike parking, it's not unlike, um, um, you know, a lot of the construction work that happens that there has to be an inspector to make sure things get done. I'm just concerned about, um, 
the fact that not everyone in this town does have a, a fence around their pool. It's not common sense. And, and that's, that's my reason for wanting to bring it forward, I guess. Um, I, I'm just curious to know what the rest of council thinks. Obviously, we've had a number of hands to just receive it. So maybe I'm the only one. I, I don't know. But uh, I want to have the discussion and maybe understand a little bit more about what the liability means. Um, uh, there's always liability on the municipality. Um, but uh, you would think that we'd be, have liability as well if we didn't have a, a, a bylaw around pools. Maybe not, but I, I would love to have a little bit more information on that as well. Is there anyone on staff who can speak to the liability? Um, I guess the liability question, if we do not enact a bylaw, do we have any liability as it stands right now? Or is as I understand it, the liability entirely on the private property owner yeah. who chooses not to enclose their pool. Hey, Your Worship, I, my, my understanding is that uh, by not enacting a bylaw, we would not be incurring a liability, um, but um, I'm, uh, I haven't been called to the bar recently. So, uh, you know, if, if council were wishing a, a legal opinion uh, on both sides of that fence, then uh, we, we could we could uh, reach out and speak to the municipal solicitor and get that information. Thank you, Councillor Lamont. Through you, uh, through you, your chair. Wouldn't the insurance companies, when they, you 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 say that you have a pool on your property, most of the policies say, "Do you have a fence and how high?" And uh, wouldn't the insurance company enforce that they have a, a fence around their pool because they would be involved in any any uh, liability, because the lawsuits go there. I think you're right, but I don't think we have anyone on staff who can answer that question, uh, because it is a legal question. Uh, Madam Clerk, do you have your hand up? Yeah, um, when I worked in Clarington, uh, we had taken that, um, <clears throat> that uh, enclosure by law away. Um, and rescinded it. And um, that was one of the reasons why the legal department at that time had mentioned was that the insurance companies are liable to make sure that the property owners have a fence around their, um, their pool. Plus then there was always um, a gated, uh, so above ground pools, those small ones that have the little steps and whatnot, they have to have those removed. Um, when they're not using it, they have to have a gated um, area for steps that are not able to be removed. Um, I just remember going through all of this at that time with that legal department. But I mean, like like Paul said, we, we don't really have a legal background to say, but that's from my knowledge from previous. And that's my recollection of the advice Brighton received uh, 15 or so years ago when we rescinded our enclosure by law uh, back in the beginning of the turn of this century, so to speak. Right. Uh, Councillor Anderson, I have your hand. Hey, thank you, Mayor. I think Candace sort of answered the, my, my question. Uh, we should probably have had some legal, but I know um, the insurance companies are pretty firm on, uh, if you report that you have a pool, they're gonna ask you to, what do you, what, do you have a fence? And uh, I've been through that. And also, we need you need to get a permit to put a pool in anyhow with the municipality, right? Correct. So, correct. Yes, pools are subject to a building permit. So, in that perm, in that permit, it probably doesn't state that you have to have a fence, but it must be have some sort of. Uh, might be worth looking at that, but uh, uh, I don't think we need to. Move, I don't think we need to move on the fence issue tonight, anyhow. I'm going to suggest, Councillor Anderson, that we do not uh, advise that they have to have a fence because we do not have an enclosure by law. And if we were to advise that they have to have a fence, we would, by virtue of giving that advice, be taking on liability. So we are probably silent on the fencing issue. It is entirely between the property owner and their insurance company. Yeah, I agree. Okay. That they, that they install a fence. Uh, Councillor Long. For you, Chair, uh, just a comment. Uh, my partner of 44 years. Uh, basically uh, wants a pool because of the COVID and we are going through that insurance uh, thing right now for our insurance policy. What we got to have, they have a very detailed drawing booklet, what we got to have for above ground, below ground, what we got to have for your built up area or a rural area. 
It's all in their book of what we got to have to have coverage and insurance for the liability. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further from members of council? Council Bateman? I just want to clarify. So uh, municipal solicitor hasn't been asked for an opinion on this or has? Yes, you know? Worship, I, I believe I did to ask for uh, the solicitor's opinion on it and I haven't received it as yet. I've also asked for the historical legal opinion that Penny West received when they considered their bylaw, a uh, pool enclosure bylaw in 2015. I haven't received that either. Anything further from members of council? Uh, go ahead, Councilor Bateman. Oh, sorry. If I could just ask uh, the Deputy Mayor to clarify what she had said earlier. Were you requesting, uh, Laura, that it be sent to the solicitor so that we can get their opinion and then have them weigh in on adding it to the fence bylaw or separate? Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Um, well, like we just heard, we don't have the opinions from the uh, solicitors in front of us at all. Um, normally, if that's the case, um, we would, we would, we would defer this right until we had the proper information in front of us. But right now, we have a motion to just receive. Um, uh, I guess if there's council, you know, is interested, I would certainly be willing to make a motion to defer this until we have just, you know, uh, an email back from our solicitor so that we can be clear on this. Bateman? I will second that motion for the Deputy Mayor. Then I'll make a motion to defer. No, it's can't talk. Uh, so the motion will read that the pool enclosure bylaw report be deferred until a legal opinion is available. Does that sound about right, Deputy Mayor? Uh, Councilor Bateman, you're still okay with as a seconder? I am, yes. The motion to defer is not debatable. Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Councilor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councilor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc. Doesn't hurt to have an opinion. Yes. Councillor Emily Raleigh. Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman. No, and the reason is, and I think I, I need to explain myself, is that we've had twice an opinion from a lawyer for the same thing. And I, I, I don't see, I think it's a waste of taxpayers' money to get another opinion that's going to tell us not to do it. So, no. Okay, Deputy Mayor Laura Vink. Mayor Brian Ostrander. No. Ms. Carried. No. That takes us to the roadside tree removal trimming report. And Mr. Parkinson, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight, sir? Not at this time, Your Worship. Thank you. The motion reads that council award the roadside tree removal and trimming contract to Tim Allen's aerial service for a one-year contract in the amount of $146,534.40, including HST, and that council authorize staff to transfer $46,534.40 from the Ontario Community Infrastructure Reserve Fund. Is there a mover? Moved by Deputy Mayor Vink, seconded by Council LeBlanc. Any discussion from members of council? Councilor Bateman? I was just going to ask, has this work already started? I just heard a lot of chatter about it, so I wasn't. Mr. Parkinson? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that, Your Worship. Uh, has the work uh, I was just asking if it had started already because there's been a lot of positives and negative people saying trees have been butchered and some saying that that's the process. So I didn't know if it had already started or. Uh, no, uh, through your worship, no, that would be our staff that's out performing work right now, either brushing or, or just hand work with chainsaws. 
Thank you, Councilor Rowley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Preston, we've had this um, done before. We had it done last year. Um, the budget that you put in this year's, um, in the 2020 budget, I'm guessing is based on last year's uh, numbers. Um, it seems like it's up a fair chunk. Can you explain why? Parkinson? Three, three year worship. Um, and no, I can't explain it actually. Uh, it's almost the same amount of trees. Uh, we put it into the same tendering process, but the company that won low bid last year didn't bid this year. Uh, so we had to go with the next lowest bid, which is uh, with Alan, or, uh, Tim Allen's aerial service. Thank you, Councilor LeBlanc. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my question was answered. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Anderson. Uh, Preston, uh, do these people do any, any of the uh, cleanup work of some uh, heavy duty brushing? Uh, part of the complaint that's been going around is also after brushing, we all know it doesn't look very attractive, but there's some areas that uh, are a little heavier than others and, and they're larger branches almost to the point they should be cut with a chainsaw or something. Are they, in, are, are they involved in any of that work or is that strictly our folks doing that? For your worship. Yes, that's our folks that are doing that. And there's a couple of locations we need to get out and clean up like Smith Street, for instance, and a couple in the north that we need to get up and clean some larger uh, debris out of the ditch just to make it look a little better before the, the grass and the seedlings start to come back up. Yeah. Okay, no, I think it's reasonable. I know you've got uh, some large trees that need to come down and I see them marked in certain areas as well. I presume you made the, or uh, our, our folks did the, uh, made some decisions on what trees should get out of there. And uh, I think I mentioned the parkette too. I think uh, the recreation department was gonna take care of that down on, on Harbor Street, uh, low low branches. We, we take care of that as well, do we? Like there's some areas that we do or? Yeah, Jim and his crew look after anything in the parkettes and then we help with larger stuff if we need to. But yeah, one of the two groups can certainly trim trees, yeah. All right. Yeah, we do have warranted. So I'm going to ask if there's any further questions on the awarding of the tender, because that's what we're here to discuss. Today. <laughs> Again, some information. Okay, send an email next time. <laughs> okay, let's go. Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? <laughs> Councillor Ron Anderson. Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman. Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc. Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley. Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman. Sorry, Mary. Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Bank. Mayor Brian Ostrander. Yes. It's carried. Thank you. And I think that takes us into motion notices of motions. Uh, the first one is a motion that was read as a notice on March 15th. And it's moved by Councillor LeBlanc. It's seconded by Councillor Bateman. The Council Direct Staff, the CAO, uh, pardon me, can the council direct the CAO staff to prepare and provide all staff reports, assumption certificates, agency reports, and ministry reports for council as it pertains to the Orchard Gate subdivision and Applewood Meadows subdivision in order to facilitate discussion and provide clarification and certainty on the ownership design and maintenance responsibilities of the stormwater pond associated with these subdivisions and further discuss the municipality's go forward plan regarding the stormwater SWP, storm, what do you mean SWP? Stormwater pond, stormwater pond, once ownership has been determined. Uh, Councillor Blanc, this is your motion. Would you like to speak to it? Yes, uh, this uh, came up with the, uh, the report that was asked to be produced that the stormwater management pond basically had a 100 year capacity of holding a 100 year rain event and um, and also that we had assumed it into uh, one thing so in 
going and looking at the subdivision agreement, uh, basically when we assume a pond, there's supposed to be a municipal, the municipal engineer is supposed to uh, supply a certificate of assumption, which I could not find. Uh, the Ministry of Environment, uh, so dating back, it would have been six years since the notice of motion came, which was done when, uh, what's her name? This is, uh, Whittlefield was on council, and which would have been six years ago. And when I look at that notice of motion, at no time does it say the pond. In the subdivision agreement, it says the pond is not to be assumed until all the parts of the subdivision is assumed which is the last thing you do because you have to clean all the stormwater, you have to clean all the stormwater uh, drains and clean the pond before you give it to the town, which uh, we're still assuming some parts of that subdivision that flows to that pond haven't been done yet. Uh, the word waterworks uh, works were used. When you look at the subdivision agreement, the word works means water and sewage. Uh, stormwater management uh, has its own, in the subdivision has its own uh, thing. When I called the Ministry of Environment and I asked who owned the pond, uh, the address is one six, well, I can't read it because of conflict a, a thing, who owns the pond. It's still the same address that owns the pond that owned it all along. In the report, it says that the pond may meet a 50 year rain event. In the ECA, it says, and it had the 18 hours retention time in the ECA it must have 39.9 hours of retention time and meet a hundred year storm uh, design. If we <laughs> did assume it at that time, you have 90 days to change the name. If you don't change the name uh, within that 90 day period, the ECA becomes invalid. So if we own the pond, we have an invalid ECA that basically ha we have to go back and reapply to the Ministry of Environment and give them the design of the pond and tell them that the pond can only meet, as per our engineer says, may meet a 50 year rain event and only has 18 hours of retention time. So I would like to revisit this and see all the proper paperwork brought in front of council. We made the decision to, uh, to assume that, that uh, part, but I wasn't part of the decision to assume the, uh, the lagoon system. So I have a lot of unanswered questions that I'd like to have answers for. Thank you. Is there any questions or comments from members of council? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councilor Ron Anderson. Uh, yes. Councilor Mark Bateman. Yes. Councilor Doug LeBlanc. Yes. Councilor Emily Rowley. Yes. Councilor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? <clears throat> Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. That's carried. Thank you. Our next motion uh, was read as a notice again on March 15th, and it's moved by Councilor Bateman, seconded by Councilor Blanc. Whereas currently our municipality's residents if they have low to moderate income, they can apply for one of two rent geared to income units in the municipality of Brighton. Whereas the municipality of Brighton currently has two RGI locations that are at capacity with approximately six year waiting lists. Whereas there is current and growing need for additional RGIs to significantly reduce the waiting wait time and accommodate future needs. It is recommended the council direct the CAO and staff to bring back to council a report detailing potential new land acquisition locations and current existing structures that could possibly be converted into an additional RGI units in the municipality of Brighton for discussion and consideration by council. Uh, Councillor Bateman, this is your motion. Would you like to speak to it? Uh, I think it pretty much goes without saying. It's not just our community, it's many that have this need. For, uh, our focus is on our community and our, the, the current ones we have, as the CAO of the county had stated when uh, she was uh, at our last council meeting, we're at capacity in ours. It's an estimated six year wait. And that based on we only have one room, one bedroom units available to begin with. So, it, and, and she touched on the fact that, you know, it would be looking at a partnership at all levels of government. So I, I don't think it's something that we can 
waste a whole lot more time on not doing anything because that six year wait to 10 year wait, whatever it is, it didn't happen overnight. That's not a COVID issue. COVID had highlighted the, you know, a lot of things, but you don't get a six year to an eight year wait overnight. And it's not any one person's fault. It's just, it is what it is. But I think we as a council have an obligation to do what we can, because if we don't retain the people in our community that are looking for two bedroom and three bedroom, you know, we're going to lose a segment of our workforce that we really need here. So I think it's pertinent that we uh, move forward and try to do something. Thank you. Questions or comments from members of council? Councillor Anderson? Um, again, we discussed this through our strategic plan. Uh, is this not sort of doubling up on already what we have achieved from our strategic plan or is this... Uh, I know this motion came sort of in the heels or in the beginning of, of our planning, but uh, um, a lot of discussion was done last fall regarding the same thing uh, and with the county as well. A, question, a big question was given to the county. Would you partner? Would you, would you look at supporting uh, Brighton? And the big question was, if you can find the land, we'll support it. That's basically, and I know we're on a number, a grid, where somebody said uh, the other day, I was on a, at a meeting with uh, Safe Communities where Coburg is like, uh, has a 12 year waiting. And so it bumps us down to, it, we're in there somewhere at number six or something. And as far as communities out of seven communities that uh, would be a, looked at in a serious way, <laughs> serious meaning serious bricks and mortar. Um, but, I agree, we need to find the land and that's something we've been told to do. It's something we know we need to do. And then once we've got a, an idea on how we can do this, if we can do it with partners and find some partners through that, um, I think we should move ahead. But this motion, I would support it because it's just it just adds to what we all believe, we need to get it done. But uh, I think it's also, I might, we need Mr. Castleman maybe to, to fill, fill us in here and where we stand. Is this a double double, um, double request? I think at the end of the day, um, what we're doing is we're simply reiterating what was said in the strategic plan. Uh, it doesn't, um, doesn't negate what we were saying, it reinforces it. So I, I, don't, I don't see the motion as problematic in any way. It just reinforces uh, our request for uh, a land inventory. And, and actually goes one step further and says, do, are we aware of any structures in the community that we could repurpose for this? Yeah. yeah. Long. Yes, uh, the strategic plan to me is a wish list, and we have none of them several ready yet. So, uh, and the direction we'd like to go, this is something immediate and it gives us a focus and it gives staff a focus to get on, to find us some property where we can get the stuff and we can work with the county on getting something done for affordable housing in our municipality. So this is totally different than strategic plan. Might be the same, but one is a wish list. This is actually, let's make it happen. Thank you. Council Bateman. Was that me, Mayor? Yes. Sorry. Yes. Oh, okay. I, I just want to reiterate, and, and I respect the, the CAO from the county coming forward at the last council meeting, but I, I will disagree on how they come up with their numbers just a little bit. and. And I first will say that, you know, being number one or number six or number seven, whatever on that, that's not a contest you want to win, being first or last on a need for affordable housing or geared to income. So I'm not going to argue over where we sit on that list. But I will say the formula that they use, if you have X number of vacancies and X number of people going in. So if you base it on percentage of the population, we're winning that contest that we don't want to win because obviously we're not the same population of Port Hope. So if we have 500 people waiting and they have 500 waiting, that's a bigger percentage of our population. So it just reiterates what we're all saying. There is a need in this town, in this municipality, sorry, there's a quarter for the jar, but uh, you know, it's not a contest we want to win, but it is something that we all have to work together and solve. I can assure you if there's going to be a municipality square jar, it won't be a quarter council. <laughs> I didn't swear, I just called it a town. I, I can hear Mary's eyes rolling now. Uh, Councillor Tenton. Thank you, Mayor. Well, instead of spinning our wheels, I think we should move on the fact that uh, all of us probably, or most of us know of land that um, the municipality owns. 
and others may know of properties that might be for sale at a reasonable price. I doubt it nowadays, the way things are going. But maybe we, I think that we at least uh, ask staff to uh, coordinate with councillors and the mayor and whoever else happens to know real estate or whatever, and let's get on with it. If, if we can come up with some land and, and uh, the county's going to keep their word, we can do something. But we can sit and talk here for another 10 years and not do anything if we don't move forward with getting the land. Thank you. And so if any member of council knows of any land, I wouldn't worry about uh, being redundant or, or doubling down on what someone else has said. Let Mr. Councilman know um, so that he can include that or at least do some investigation to ensure that the municipality is in ownership so that he can include that in the report that he's been directed to bring forward to council. Any other discussion, members of council? Go ahead, Councilor Tadman. I just think uh, we should all consider that the, we might be able to retrofit to some of the bigger or older buildings too. So we should keep that in mind also. Not that we own them, but maybe it would be worth um, making that investment. So, and, and other other municipalities have done great jobs with the uh, retrofitting older buildings. With the price of building materials now, it might, might be easier to do something like that cheaper. And that, that is included in the motion. Okay. Anything further from members of council? I just want to say that the strategic plan is not a wish list. It is the um, sort of governing document of the municipality and of council. So I know that the work plans that uh, Mr. Councilman puts together for the directors are based on uh, the strategic plan. So absolutely not a wish list, but uh, council's direction for the next uh, uh, 18 months or so uh, until the good people of Brighton make whatever their next choice will be for the folks around this table. Um, procedurally, Councillor Bateman, um, council doesn't recommend to itself. So your last line reads, it is recommended that council direct, et cetera, et cetera. And it should read something like, um, um, therefore be it resolved that council direct the CAO, et cetera, et cetera. Are you okay if I make that change? That's, that's fine with me. Are you okay with that, Councillor LeBlanc, as a seconder? Yes. So the last line is simply changed to therefore be it resolved that council direct the CAO and staff and then, the, then it remains the same as it goes through. Is there any further discussion? Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Mm. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink. Mayor Brian Ostrander. Yes. It's carried. Thank you. Our third motion also, also comes from the March 15th meeting and it's moved by Councillor Tadman, seconded by Councillor Rowley. According to our municipal mission statement, we will protect the health and well-being of the community. Protecting the health and safety of residents, volunteers, and visitors of Brighton should be of utmost importance. Therefore, we would recommend that because some policies are either lacking or not well-defined, staff review or create policy focused on cleaning protocols for all municipal facilities that include direction and responsibilities for boards and tenants. Councillor Tadman, this is your motion. Would you like to speak to it? Uh, yes, I would, but uh, I think um, probably uh, Councillor Rowley has more information on it than I do. But I, I do think that um, every every uh, everything that we own should have a, a, a policy that sets forward exactly how we deal with both the health and safety. And it's been so long. Uh, You'll have to help me out here, Councillor Rowley. Why did we uh, put this one in? Was it to do with the, the library? Yeah, yes. Yeah, I thought yeah. so. Yeah. 
so there was a problem at the library and uh, the question was in a situation where someone got sick and, and so what's the protocol who do who cleans it up obviously staff shouldn't and especially well they shouldn't anyways but there there's certain protocol and and so the uh, the staff didn't know exactly who to call and we don't necessarily know that the, the, the our regular caretaker whatever we we call him does that kind of thing so i think First of all, we got to establish, you know, what happens in situations like that. Does that cover it all, Councillor Rowley? I'm uh, not sure. I, I think it covered most of it, uh, Councillor Chapman. If I could just kind of add to that a little bit, the the confusion seemed to be about how to clean, what to clean, what with, and who yeah. was responsible for what. Especially maybe in the library where we share space as far as the lobby and I mean, this happened in the library section, but there were concerns that there wasn't really um, any direction or anything for um, the library staff to follow in these kind of things. So um, there just seemed to be a whole lot of confusion about um, whose responsibility and um, certain steps that needed to be taken in a case like this. And especially maybe now during um, the COVID time, things need to be probably a little more um, detailed out. So uh, yeah, that's basically the reason for our motion. Uh, I think Mayor, you probably have to change a few lines in this one as well as we have recommended, but maybe we need to direct or whatever it is we need to do. I will leave that wording up to you. Back to that before we read the motion. We don't have a problem directing, do we? Councillor Anderson. Uh, to me, uh, to Councillor Tadman and uh, Emily Raleigh, I, I think it's a health and safety matter. It's something that should be in the health and safety manual uh, for and whoever is responsible for the library as such, whether it's under the, under the umbrella of the of the uh, municipality or the or the I'll use the town hall as an example. If it's all under one, then there should be protocol for that there should be a health and safety officer there should be blah blah so all that information should be in that manual and it should be posted on where to get that information and i think it might be time for from what you're reading between the the lines here it might be a good time to to review the the, the health and safety policy for that particular area if that's a, if there's a weakness there if I can just respond, that's that seems to be where the problem is. I believe that staff reached out um, to the municipality. I believe they spoke with uh, someone at Public Works. I also believe, I think they also spoke with the fire chief. There just seemed to be confusion as to what exactly needed to be done, who was responsible for doing it, and um, you know where to get maybe even the proper products to clean whatever as some of these things have to be handled. You know, it's not just soap and water that we're dealing with here, right? Some of this stuff is chemical. They're not well versed in that maybe. Um, so the, there was just a whole lot of, there was just a whole lot of confusion about that. So, you know, if something could be just cleared up and, and maybe it's something too, now that we, you know, we have uh, more buildings that we uh, own and maintain than just 35 Alice, you know, we have tenants in the, um, in the health services building as well. And I'm not sure how all of that works, but we just thought it might be time to just kind of review some of the details of these uh, these, these policies. I think it's Deputy Mayor. We have a health and safety committee already. Um, I would love to hear from the CAO perhaps as to whether or not um, that uh, they uh, currently um, are mandated to also cover what happens uh, within the whole building, um, in particular the library or not, uh, just so that we make sure that uh, if we're going to put this uh, motion forward that it's actually asking what it needs to ask um, or whether we just need to, whether we need a motion or not. Is this something that's being handled already or is it not? Yeah. Sir, uh, I'll, I'll jump in here and uh, certainly I, I don't want to uh, blow this out of proportion. The bottom line is uh, 
on a couple of occasions back in the fall, uh, uh, a couple of youngsters uh, vomited within uh, the library area. And uh, because of the COVID uh, uh, protocols that uh, uh, were being developed at that time, uh, staff were uncertain with respect to uh, how, how, how to go about uh, uh, cleaning up that um, human fluid. Uh, so uh, the clarity is that uh, the municipality is responsible for cleaning both the library and the lobby downstairs, full stop. And uh, um, we needed to respond accordingly and, uh, and did not. Um, we have health and safety policies in place that uh, uh, deal with issues of this nature. And we also have a COVID team uh, that meets internally uh, that includes um, uh, the librarian uh, that uh, are constantly reviewing protocols associated with uh, uh, COVID and how we are gonna handle that. Certainly over the course of the last uh, uh, week or so, I've had direct discussions with the uh, library CEO along with the chairperson. And we all agree that uh, um, we don't wanna blow this issue out of, uh, um, out of context. And in the future, if the librarian has an issue, she simply needs to pick up the phone and call me and uh, we'll resolve it. Do we need to have a comprehensive review of policies? Um, might, be, might, might be helpful in the long run, Having said that, I don't want to blow this out of proportion. Thank you, Mr. Parkinson. I saw your hand. Sorry, if I could just add to uh, the CAO's comments. We've since developed a roster of cleaning companies that are qualified to come in and clean bodily fluids uh, from different areas. So we now have that roster, and I believe those contacts have been um, circulated to Heather just in case um, there's some confusion or, or it's after hours and we're not quick and handy that uh, she's able to make that call directly herself if needed to get it addressed as quick as possible. Thank you, Councillor Tadman. Yeah, I don't, uh, we were at what, two meetings now that we've talked about it. So it wasn't as if Heather, all of it, Heather knew all this time what the protocol was and she was asking. So I don't think we're, a, making anything alarming and I don't see any problem with updating any policies within the municipality. I think it should be done on a regular basis. And the other point that uh, I would make is the lobby shared by all kinds of people uh, and it shouldn't be the responsibility of the library. So you know, that needs to be sorted out too. If something happens in a library, who's, who's responsible? And then there was some talk about that the library had to get their own cleaning people. Uh, am I not correct in that, uh, Councillor Rowley? So, yes. Uh, yes. So that kind of, you know, was disturbing for them because they thought that we we're under the same agreement as the rest of the municipality. So um, I think just a bunch of things, answers need to be made to, all the way around. And I still would think that we should update the health and safety policies. Well, it's always nice uh, through your, your worship. It's always nice to update the safety policy, especially your MDS sheets that will tell you what chemicals you can mix and which you can't, which one you can use for cleaning. And uh, it's always good to look at them because you're changing all the chemicals all the time. Like you would never want to use uh, Javex 12% with basically uh, pine salt. Do you think you get a good cleaning solution? You end up with vapors that will burn the inside of your nose. But anyway, it's always good to do that and learn about all the chemicals. At least we do it once a year, so which is good. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. I think there again, I don't think our uh, intention was to blow this out of proportion. I'm glad to see that the staff has reached out and that, you know, the library maybe now has a better idea as to what exactly their responsibilities are and how to handle this. But there, there seemed to be a lot of concern and just a little bit of confusion. So I'm glad to see that that, uh, that has maybe been cleared up now in that uh, 
yeah, maybe the policies don't need to be fixed today, but uh, there might be time for review at some point when staff aren't maybe as, as busy. And but I, I think, yeah. So the motion before us um, from a procedural uh, level is, is the same as the last one where we're recommending something to ourselves and council doesn't do that. We, we provide direction. So to be procedurally accurate, uh, I would recommend that we change. Therefore, we recommend that to therefore be it resolved that. And then we could read the rest of it. Although um, when we read the rest of it, it reads because some policies are either lacking that really should be a whereas statement. So my recommendation would be to have it read, therefore be it resolved that staff review or create policy focused on cleaning protocols, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm looking to the mover to see if that's okay. Uh, it is okay, Mayor, but to, our main purpose, I, I'm pretty sure Councillor Rowley will agree with me, was to get this in front of council so that um, the library people, especially the library staff and, uh, and the municipal staff understood who was responsible for what. And so nothing seemed to be addressed until we brought it here tonight. And then all of a sudden it seems like everything's been done all this last week. So I guess the motion did what we wanted it to do, Councillor Rowley. So I wouldn't, I would even be willing to pull the motion, but, but I really do hope that uh, any uh, health and safety policies should, should at least be updated every couple of years. So uh, do what you want with it, Mayor. Uh, you can pull it if you'd like, I, uh, I will sit back. Now that it seems to be addressed, do you feel, Councillor Rowley, that it's addressed now? If, I think there's been some thought given to it, so I would certainly support you, Councillor Chapman, if you want to uh, withdraw the motion, we can just move forward. Yep. So let's move on. So are you are you withdrawing the motion, Councillor Chapman? Yeah, I think so, because it sounds like it's been addressed now. Um, the CAO said he's talked to um, the CAO of the library board and our public works has got companies that are going to be recommended. So that's what we wanted to get to, but we weren't able to get to that till tonight. So I'm glad it's, uh, we could go back to the library board now and say we did our job. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. The motion is withdrawn. I move on to the next motion also originally read as a notice on March 15th. And it reads, oh, sorry, it's moved by Councillor Anderson. Seconded by Councillor Rowley. Whereas the municipality of Brighton was successful in installing two outside skating rinks last year, 2020, one located at King Woodruff Park and the other at the Codrington Center. And whereas residents and family users of the rinks have requested some enhancement by additional amenities as benches and shelters during very cold periods, and whereas there is now corporate residents of the municipality that would like to help sponsor two movable skate shacks to be placed seasonably at each location at an approximate portable an approximate portable buildings eight by twelve at an approximate cost of twenty five hundred dollars each, and whereas these movable buildings could be used for other activities by the municipality or community groups at other times i.e. Applefest, summer pop-ups, and other events. And whereas a volunteer committee with Councillors Anderson and Rowley would like to organize soon to complete this project by next season on behalf of the municipality. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the municipality of Brighton approve and authorize recreation staff to work with a volunteer committee to complete said project on behalf of the residents of Brighton. Councillor Anderson, this is your motion. Would you like to speak to it? Well, you did a good note. <coughs> Am I still there? Sorry. You're here. You're here. There you go. Now you're really okay. here. Uh, thank you, Mayor. You, I don't think there's a lot more to add to that other than how this came about was uh, just in fun with other communities started to do, do things like this. Uh, the outdoor rinks became really popular this past winter because of we know why. And um, ours, I think, became 
fairly popular. Uh, we put it together in a bit of a hurry, but our rec, rec department did an excellent job getting it all together and in Codrington and at King and Edward Park. And uh, there were some local folks that uh, after putting out a little, some, bit, some information about what other communities had come up with, uh, these shacks or, or these buildings where people can have some shelter while they, uh, while they get ready to skate as well as a place maybe to leave their shoes. Uh, uh, so what we did was uh, had a conversation and all of a sudden we've got three business people in town that are, want to uh, contribute funds and uh, sponsor such an event or, or a, such, a, such a project uh, to the tune that we have probably enough, if it all comes through the funds to build one or to buy one now. Um, so, we would like to continue the process, uh, looking for further sponsorship, where it might not cost the municipality any money to have, uh, to at least establish these. And um, we think it would be good, to, a good addition, a good amenity to add to next year's outdoor rinks. And uh, I know uh, Jim and Parks and Rec has plans to 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 put the the rink in a different location, perhaps in Connerington, so the grounds level and <laughs> things like that. But uh, I think some shelter up there and some shelter even at King Edward Park would be a, a real bonus. And if we can do it for next to nothing, uh, that'd be great. And then these these buildings would have a, if they could be stored properly uh, when they're not being used for the winter, which they would be designed for, that they could be moved and they could use be used uh, for other events in town. And I uh, we listed them there, but uh, even the pop-up opportunity uh, that came up after, but that's an that's an idea they could be used for too. So anyhow, I think it's great for the community, and this, I won't mention the uh, supporters at this time because but we would be forming a committee, and uh, they would be part of it, and away we go. Thank you, Council Anderson, and we have received correspondence on this. Are there any questions or comments from members of council? Councilor Bateman. Just a question around the costing. How do we know how much is this coming from Mr. Miller? Does, should that not come from staff on that type of stuff or? mean the $2,500? Yeah, the, the yeah. cost of them, yeah. Can I answer that? If you know where the money, the dollar, if you know where the quote is coming from, you can answer that. I did research. We have some local builders that'll do it for, for that or less. Uh, that's based on the, the size that uh, we, that Emily and I put in this uh, it was eight by 12, but it could definitely be a little smaller than that. And I think it probably will be, uh, which it would be less money and it's well structured. Uh, you can also buy already pre, uh, you can already purchase pre sheds uh, uh, for a lot less than that too. So uh, there would be ample uh, to, to use for what we're, we're talking about. So I think this is a ceiling uh, again, if we raise five thousand dollars through support uh, um, sponsors, it's I don't think I don't I'm not asking we're not asking for a council to uh, come up with any money tonight. We're just suggesting that's that's the type of budget we're going to be working within a committee to try to achieve that, so we can have two shacks. Not, but if we only have the money for one shack, so be it. Thank you. So that answers your question, Councillor Bateman. The, the figure was sourced by a member of council. Uh, yeah, I just had another question because at my last uh, meeting for the CCA, because the, the notice of motion was out then. So let's think in terms of post COVID because I like to think positive, but it's not gonna be here forever. If we're gonna place a structure out in that area, they typically look after the grounds there and they have their own thing. So in post COVID, or it, it, and I, I like this idea because you could use it for different things, but I'd like to see that we include them in any conversation out there at that committee level before we start placing stuff all over where they place stuff and at least involve them in that process. I'll just respond to that. Uh, tonight we needed to get council's support or not, and then we can, we can move on all those things. So we still have a lot of work to do. We get some more sponsorship. Uh, we haven't done uh, any campaigning as such uh, to to get that sponsorship but people have uh, sort of jumped off the page really quick to uh to support us so uh, 
we don't want to let them down either. So. Mayor? Somebody said something. I said, I asked the deputy mayor if she had her hand up, but it, oh. it would appear that maybe we've lost her temporarily. She seems to be frozen. Um, yeah, Councilor LeBlanc. So you, oh, is the deputy mayor coming by? Oh, uh, I, I this is, to me, this is easy to support. This is uh, really well thought of, uh, good show. And uh, I'd, I'd go for this in a, because it's good for the community, it's good for the residents and, and the constituents that can use it in the, in the built up area and the rural area at the same time and other events. So I'm, I'm in support of this 100%. Councilor Tadman. Oh, I don't, I didn't have my hand out, hand up. I was scratching my head. <laughs> I'm going to go back to the deputy mayor then. Deputy mayor. Um, uh, so uh, just a couple of questions. I just want to clarify that uh, you're not actually asking for money from council. Um, and the second thing is uh, I would suggest you just uh, make sure that uh, as members of council, you're allowed to solicit funds from people from the community for this because um, um, when doing that same thing for Apple Fest, we were told we were not allowed to do that as members of council. So just be sure that uh, you're going about this in the correct way. I think it's a great idea. I don't want to, I just want to make sure it runs smoothly. Perhaps a little bit of input from staff as far as how to do it correctly would be a good idea. Can I Can just I respond? Okay, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, Emily, Emily and I will respond to that. Okay. I'm going to go to council rally. Okay, thank you. It's okay, Ron. We've, we've got this covered. Uh, to the deputy mayor's comments regarding the solicitation, yes, uh, the one, one of our sponsors um, has already, uh, you know, offered to step up and do that part of, of the uh, campaigning for us, Laura, so that uh, I know I had that conversation with Councillor Anderson that we are not out there uh, soliciting money. Uh, and, and in fact, once Ron brought this up, once it was kind of in, in social media, it basically fell in our laps and we just, you know, we just don't want to disappoint those citizens who really want to support what we do here, support not only youth, but, you know, good, good, healthy outdoor um, exercise and things. So this, this, we want to just be there to help move it along and support them. But uh, yes, as you and I both know, we'll play by the rules. Thank you. And I just want to get some language clarity on this motion. Um, there are a couple of things that I think we should change just for our own peace of mind. Um, I would highly recommend removing the cost of $2,500 from the motion, mm -hmm. um, uh, unless and until we have actual quotes from municipal staff. Um, it may not cost us anything if, if uh, this is entirely volunteer done, or it may cost us more. I mean, we just don't know. So I would highly recommend that. This is your motion. Um, is, are, are, we, are we creating a committee with this motion? Is that everybody's understanding here? Or is there already a group of people who don't want to be paid by the municipality getting ready to do this, these tasks with the help of councillors Anderson and Rowley? I, I guess that's I guess that's the gist. These people, you know, they want to step up and help us out um, voluntarily. Obviously, we just want to be, you know, a proactive group that goes forward with probably the blessing of council that uh, Councillor Anderson and I sit with them to uh, to see if we can get this done before next winter. But if I could right, just. Ron? If I could step in, the, the intention was never to, to, the intention was to do this all on a, on a dime and uh, with volunteers. And uh, that's, that's how it's going to we'll be presented when we first, when we, if we go back to the, I'll call them sponsors, but there's a lot of other people that want to be part of this, uh, even though they're not major sponsors, uh, they just want to help and they want to be part of this. But it really doesn't need a lot of people. Uh, we need, uh, Parks and Rec to help maybe coordinate coordinate everything because it's on public on public land and right. you know there's going to be some costs involved with the municipality as far as manpower and administration but these are going to be owned by the uh, municipality and used for forever length that they can survive and and uh, what I was looking at is something that will survive not just a, a year or two so 
and uh, and our rinks are when we got the rinks there were, they have a life of uh, know, five to ten years or something. Jim, you can confirm that. So that's what got me thinking. We're in this for the long haul, and we can improve on our facilities every year, maybe, and maybe uh, expand that. So rather than take a lot of your time tonight. Um, we're willing to get moving on it and keep you informed on how it goes. And if we need money, we'll come to you later. No, no, I'm just let's, kidding. Let's move to paragraph three. And whereas there is now corporate residence, et cetera, et cetera, there's a couple changes I'd like to see made there. In the second line, it says skate shacks to be placed seasonably. That should that should be seasonally. Are you okay with that change? Yeah, I, I, saw, I couldn't correct that. Yeah, it's all right. And are you okay removing um, at approximate cost of twenty five hundred dollars each? Yeah, I just that was for your information. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And then moving down to the fourth line, uh, to for fifth line, fifth paragraph, and where is a volunteer committee with councillors Anderson and I would like, et cetera, et cetera. Can we uh, read? Uh, can we have that read? And whereas a group of volunteers together with councillors Rowley, et cetera, et cetera. Is that? Is that okay? I just don't want to call it a committee. And now we're on the hook to have a committee of council report back to us on what's happening. It's a group of volunteers, right? That's good. Okay. The intent, and that's what it'll be as far as um, uh, Council Raleigh and I are concerned. So so we'll, we'll make sure it's done that way. And then essentially the same on the therefore line. Now, therefore, be a result of the municipal council approve and authorize recreation staff to work with a group of volunteers. Is that okay? Absolutely. All right. With those changes, are there any questions or comments from members of council? Um, Mr. Miller, Mr. Castleman, do you see any pitfalls if we move forward here? Councilman first. Not from my end. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Not really. I just think we just need to have communication open between myself and the volunteer group so that uh, we're both on the same page and have the same expectations. So I will leave it to um, Councilors Rowley and Anderson to uh, be wary of the herding of proverbial cats. Uh, when when we get this volunteer team together, Councilor Bateman, I was just going to pretty much say that same thing. It could be an ad hoc committee, which is in a committee of council with Councilor Tad or Councilor Rowley and Mr. Anderson, Councilor Anderson, but an ad hoc committee that basically, if the CAO wishes, that the Director of Public or Parks and Rec can oversee. An ad hoc committee wouldn't be a committee of council, correct? That, that way, everything, you know, Councillor Rowley and Anderson can still be there, but everything really has, should be going to a staff member. If it's an ad hoc committee, it's not a committee of council, and then you're really following all the things you're supposed to follow. If, if it's an ad hoc committee and we pass a motion saying so, then it's an ad hoc committee of council. Okay. So we'd still be on the hook to, to pay for gotcha. it. It would just be a time limited for a specific purpose at that point. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I think we're better off calling it a group of volunteers and uh, naming councillors Rowley and Anderson as sort of the, the, the volunteers in chief, if you will. Any further discussion on this? Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Councillor Ron Anderson. Am I in, con in, um, am I in conflict to vote on this? No. no. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not allowed to give you that advice, Councilor uh, Anderson. <laughs> I'm voting on it anyhow. It's going to, anyhow, yes. Yeah. Councilor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councilor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councilor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councilor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. It's carried. 
Thank you, everybody. Now we move to our notices of motions, and the first will be moved by Councillor Anderson and seconded by Deputy Mayor Vink. Whereas the municipality of Brighton is rapidly is rapidly growing, and there has been a need demonstrated now and in the future for services for the Halliburton for the Pine Ridge Health Unit or hub directly located in the municipality of Brighton. And where is the nearest office for in-person service in Northumberland County now is Port Hope to the west? <clears throat> and where is the health unit office moved out of Brighton in June of 2016? And where is it is council's desire to have the municipality of Brighton partner with the provincial government and HKPR to again establish a health unit office or hub in Brighton? We request, we, re we request staff to set up a meeting with the board of directors of the HKPR to see if it is feasible to reestablish their services in Brighton and research the possibilities of space for a return to the municipality. This motion ties into strategic planning initiative, promote wellness in the community, develop medical space to accommodate doctors and other medical services. This will come forward as a motion at the May 3rd meeting. The next notice of motion reads, okay, will be moved by Councillor Anderson and seconded by Deputy Mayor Vink, whereas the municipality of Brighton Um, where's the municipality of Brighton and are looking for an opportunity to rid used but usable household items rather than through yard sales and needless trips to our landfill. And whereas other communities at this time are holding or considering curbside giveaway day, a popular environmental green initiative. And whereas the giveaway day is meant to normalize the reuse and donation of unwanted but usable items and keep them from ending up in landfills while promoting the sharing of economy or promoting the sharing economy. And whereas any items that are not picked up that day will have to be brought back in. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Municipality of Brighton Council and authorized staff determine the best date this spring day for this initiative and to set out the rules for residents taking part. This motion ties into the Strategic Planning Initiative to build a workable and livable community. This will come forward as a motion at the May 3rd meeting. Next notice of motion is will be moved by Councilor LeBlanc, seconded by Deputy Mayor Vink. Why we do not believe recording of closed session is prudent. The recordings are invariably inaccurate. The recordings often pick up cross talk, making being recorded either irrelevant or garbled. Topics discussed in closed session are often sensitive at times, involving personal information for persons close to members of council. The fact that the discussion is being recorded can impose a chill on the participants. The recordings can be problematic in the event of accidental or, or intentional release. They are discoverable in litigation, given that from the municipality's perspective, it is what is done, not what was said. That matters. The submission of a recording can cause disproportionate harm in the course of litigation. They are of marginal benefit in investigations, it being the case that the person in the room have to be interviewed in any event if what was said is relevant to the investigation. Given the frailties noted above, their marginal utility in the event of an investigation is ever to occur seems not to support a cost benefit analysis. The Municipal Act 2001 specifically provides that all resolutions, discussions, and other proceedings of council that take place must be recorded. The Act does not require municipalities to create verbatim transcripts of meetings. The motion reads that council amend policy AD 690 audio recording of council meetings be by revoking recording of closed session council meetings. And this will come forward as a motion on May 3rd. There is no unfinished business in the agenda, which takes us into bylaws. The first bylaw is with regard to Miller Paving Limited surface treatment application. And it reads that council gives a bylaw, it's first, second, and third reading, and finally passes on this date being a bylaw to authorize the mayor and clerk to execute an agreement between the Corporation of the Municipality of Brighton and the Miller Paving Limited for surface treatment application. Is there a mover? Councillor LeBlanc, seconded by Councillor Bateman. Discussion from members of council? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. 
Deputy Mayor Laura Vink. Mayor Brian Ostrander. Yes. And it's carried. Thank you. We now move into the consent agenda portion of the meeting where the uh, motion will read that we receive um, correspondence from Campbell from Warner Hospital, McPhail Cemetery, Great Auxiliary Rescue Unit, the update from Northumberland County, and the Lower Train Conservation Correspondence regarding MZOs. Is there anything anyone would like to bring out of the consent agenda to be debated under a separate cover? I will read, be it resolved, the staff recommendations with respect to consent agenda 13.1 to 13.5 be adopted as printed. Is there a mover? By Councillor Anderson, seconded by Deputy Mayor Vink. Is there any discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rally. Yes. Councillor Ta um, Mary Tadman. Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink. Mayor Brian Ostrander. Yes. That's carried. Thank you. And now we move into re reports of advisory committees of council, reports, minutes, and council reports. The first is the Economic Development Advisory Committee. And the motion reads that council adopt the minutes of the February 4th, 2021 and March 4th, 2021 Economic Development Advisory Committee meetings. And the council approved the addition of a rural agricultural representative to the committee composition as shown in the revised term of reference. Terms of reference. Is there a mover? Moved by Councillor Anderson. Seconded by Councillor Rowley. Any discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councilor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councilor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councilor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councilor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councilor Mary Tadman? And to yes. the, there we go. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next is our Heritage Advisory Committee, and the motion is that Council adopt the minutes of the February 1st, 2021 Heritage Advisory Committee meeting, and the Council approve the addition of 82 Main Street to the Municipal List of Heritage Properties. Is there a move? Moved by Deputy Mayor Vink, seconded by Council Rowley. The discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councilor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councilor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councilor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councilor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councilor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. It's carried. Well, thank you. That takes us to reports and minutes of statutory committees, boards, and external agencies. The first comes from the Lower Trent Conservation Authority. And the motion reads that Council received the Lower Trent Conservation Authority Board of Directors meeting minutes March 11, 2021, Hearing Board meeting minutes March 11, 2021, Source Protection Authority meeting minutes November 12, 2020. Is Moved by Councilor LeBlanc. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councilor Anderson. Is there any discussion? Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Councilor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councilor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councilor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councilor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councilor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Ving? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. Carrie. Thank you. The next is from the library. The motion is that council receive the Brighton Public Library meeting minutes of February 24th, 2021. Is there a mover? Moved by Councilor Rowley. Is there a seconder? Councilor Bateman? Any discussion? Deputy Mayor? 
No, no discussion. Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Councilor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councilor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councilor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councilor Emily Rally? Yes. Councilor Mary Tadman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. It's carried. Thank you. That takes us to question period. Madam Clerk, are you aware of anyone joining us to ask a question about an item that pertains to tonight's agenda? Uh, no, I do not see anything. Thank you. We have no in-camera session this evening. It takes us to confirmatory bylaw that council gives a bylaw. It's first, second, and third reading and finally passes on this date. Seeing a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Corporation of the Municipality of Brighton Council meeting held on April 19th, 2021. Are you moving that motion, Councilor Bateman? No, I just had a quick question for you, Mayor, if I could. Yep. I, I, the uh, notice is a motion. I didn't catch the date you said they'd come forward. Uh, I, uh, May said May 3rd. I hope I'm right. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. If, if I could just comment, I was looking at 10.6 and I was thinking that would be really nice if we could have that coincide with that cleanup that's been announced. That's gonna be when people are cleaning up the street, but that's gonna fall after that. I can't remember the dates. I think it ended before May 3rd. And you yeah, can do it all at once. The, the cleanup theoretically should happen this week with our collection next week uh, of Gritterbridge. So um, the it, it's probably best that it doesn't bump up against one another anyway. We don't want- public work staff picking up people's couches when they're meant to be given away. I know where one is in a fridge. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, you had your hand up, so I'm making you the mover of this motion, okay? There you go. And sorry Secretary. about that. <laughs> Councilor Rowley. So that's moved by Councilor Bateman, seconded by Councilor Rowley. Madam Clerk, is there any discussion on the confirmatory bylaw? Members of Council? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Mark, I think the fridge is gone. <laughs> Councillor Mary Rodman? Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Vink? Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. We get a lot of information while we're voting. That's carried. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Clerk. And ladies and gentlemen, it's 9.07 p.m. Thank you for joining us uh, tonight. Appreciate all the input from staff and, of course, the two delegates. I'm declaring this meeting adjourned, and we'll see you all.